cryptocurrency channel blight fluid and now it's time for the second part of our current far beyond the world episode when shall we three meet again i'm thrown off by a sudden knock to the door cautiously i place the book down onto the table and slowly approach my main worry is the blackmail i really don't know how our interaction would go right now is that um, you there Rissa's voice is no real comfort either, so I'm immediately reminded of the massive bruise I sport. Fuck. But I can't pretend not to be in, as that would cause an alarm, while trying to cover my neck would only draw more attention to it. Ugh. I yank the door open, letting the female in. I'll have to bite another bullet. It's becoming a pattern here. She steps inside, giving me curious glances. Once the door is shut, I try to put on a brave smile, but to no effect. I see you're no longer at the butchery. I wonder why that might be. She states knowingly, her piercing gaze causing me to wince. I dart my eyes to the side, rubbing my arm and unwittingly exposing the bruise. What's this? Bingo. She gently lifts up my chin to expose the neck. What happened? Her voice takes on a monotone, almost as if she'd expected this. I really don't want to add fuel to the fire. And I feel that in part I was kind of asking for this. Well, is not a chatty type, and if you poke a wild wolf with a stick... Ugh. We were sparring. I blurt out, surprising even myself. What? I, I was the one who insisted. I was tired of being teased as a weakling, so I asked Wool to give me a few pointers. Her eyes narrow and her brows set on a single line, giving me a look of utter disbelief. He just got carried away. It doesn't take much to bruise me. I laugh awkwardly, but she still doesn't budge. We decided I should stay put until it's gone, so others won't jump to conclusions. Mm-hmm... She arches one brow, still not giving in. Seriously, if he wanted to hurt me, he would. It was just a silly accident. With full, hardly anything is an accident, but uh, suit yourself. Finally, she shrugs me off and pulls out a chair. When I asked him where you were, he simply scoffed at me. I was worried you might be left without any provisions, but I see you've got fresh water and food. How did that come about? Oh, shit. The water was from the spring. And how did you know where the spring was? I wince again, shutting my eyes and bracing for the worst. Tano took me there. Tano? She jolts up immediately. Are you serious? The female throws her gaze towards the table, locking it with the tarts. Those are chorus, aren't they? I nod uncomfortably. Sam, you're supposed to keep away from the others. Tano is close to the elders, and as much as I like Cora, she's Vither's daughter. You're playing with fire interacting with those two. Oh, for crying out loud. I knew it was lunacy to leave you in the care of that idiot. Well, it's not entirely his fault. Not his fault? He was supposed to make sure you're safe and fed. Instead, I find you foraging around the village, left at the mercy of the very wolves who could get us all exposed. The second time I get to hear a melodic growl, it sends a shiver down my spine. She must have picked up on my growing anxiety as she cuts it off and gives me a rather startled look. I just stand there, almost like a child getting dressed down by their parent. Sorry, I didn't mean to take this out on you. She finally sighs, releasing the pent of anger. There's just a lot at stake here, and somehow everyone's acting as if it's just a game. Rannoch suddenly bolting, ditching us with, no offence, you, when he's the one who brought you here in the first place. None taken. I shrug, giving her a weak smile. Then you have full of things he can strong on people left and right. Not to mention you acting like a pup on a playground, cuddling up to every wolf you see. I'm just fed up with having to be the responsible one. She leans against the table, crossing her arms and looking into the distance. 
I really don't know what to say to her. It does seem like she's the only one keeping this scheme together. I'm about to speak up when her eyes lock on me again. Why aren't you wearing the dress? Her voice carries slight suspicion. Was he giving you heat over it again? Is that what caused this? She points to my neck. No, no. I try to avoid circling back to my row with Vol. I just didn't want to ruin it. Ruin it by wearing it around the house? Is it not comfortable? She asks with a hint of worry. No, it's great. You know what? You're right. I nod and rush towards the bedroom. I'll go put it on. Do you have any moonshine left or did Vol chuck it all down? The female calls out as I unfurl the silk dress. I don't think there's any left, no. Uh, I'll get some ale then. She mutters while I pull the garment over my head. I hear the barrel's lid lift up and she scoffs. <laughs> the ale is nearly gone as well. Yeah. I reply to an awkward chuckle, straightening the fabric and securing the waistline with the belt. There, yeah, all done. I smile, seen already seated at the table and taking an idle sip. How good. The female nods with approval. I didn't spend all that time fitting and stitching it together for you to treat it as a tablecloth. True. I mumble nervously, taking a seat and just watching her enjoy the drink. After a second sip, she breaks the silence and looks to me inquisitively. Are you going to join me, or is your intention to make this even more awkward? You're right. I could use one too. I agree and get up to fetch a mug. Since pretty much everything else is dirty, I have to strain myself to reach up for a spare one from the top shelf. I haven't done a proper wash-up in a while, but now knowing where the spring is, I can easily amend that. I dunk the tankard into the barrel, a little concerned about the remaining levels of the liquid. Those wolves do drink a lot. So I take my seat and lean back comfortably. I can see her gaze is still drilled into the distance. She's buried in thought, and I cannot help but think she's worrying about the bruise. You're right. I try to nudge her and she blinks as if stirred back to life. She gives me a deeply concerned look. This whole setup doesn't sit well with me. I don't know what Rannoch's thinking, and Vol. Ugh. She sighs in defeat. He's just doing everything to prove me right. I think Vol is slightly overwhelmed by all of this. In his own way, he's trying his best to look out for the both of you. It would do wonders if you could simply give in some time. I mutter reluctantly. It's not like I'm in a position to give her advice on how to deal with wolves she knew her whole life. But this is new. And to all of us. I kind of threw your group dynamic out of balance. It must be hard for him to understand, let alone accept. Hmm. The female muses for a moment and then gives me a kind smile. You're an unusual person, Sam. I don't think I've ever met anyone as empathetic and forgiving as you. Then again, I was raised among wolves. She scoffs in amusement. What do I know? A great deal more than I do, that's for sure. I laugh, causing her to chuckle. However, her voice hushes as her eyes land on the yellow flower resting inside the cup. Well, that's a nice touch. Uh oh? Mm hmm. She nods, crooning softly. Do you know the significance of dandelions? Their meaning? Um, no, not really. I shake my head awkwardly, again feeling a knowing gaze on me. They're a flower of healing, but also hope. Between lovers, they're a promise of happiness and loyalty. She emphasises and I feel a blush slowly creeping onto my face. Thankfully she does not linger on it. But above all, they're a flower of chance, a wish away, a reminder that our dreams can come true if we only reach for them. So much meaning in such a small, simple thing. The female pets the dandelion softly, a gentle smile stretching across her muzzle. I find small, simple things the most beautiful. I mutter, not knowing why I said it, and she snickers. Said one small, simple thing about another. Small I might be, but did she just call me simple as well? 
at least your caller is a bit more subtle. Caller? She's definitely hinting at something. I tried to hide my red cheeks behind the tankard, slowly slurping the ale. Rannick was only trying to cheer me up. I brush it off, even if she seems supportive, I'm not about to admit to anything. Besides, the flower is of my choice. I just found them uplifting on a gloomy day. He's been stealing my resolve with them ever since. Consider it too. The female sighs, toying with the dandelion, I cannot help but feel a bit bad. She's completely disheartened, and it becomes obvious she's hinting at the black wolf's shortcomings. Well, does seem to care a lot about you a lot, you know. I mutter, drawing a surprised gaze. At first I think I might have crossed the line, but she's the one who started it. The female simply concedes in defeat. At times it feels like he does, but then he proves the exact opposite. For the most part, Vol acts as if he never knew any of us at all. She deflects, trying her hardest not to look emotionally invested in the subject. It's not like she isn't right, though. Vol does seem to ignore many aspects of Rannoch's personality. Perhaps he really doesn't know them. Rannoch said that he has to keep his mask on at all times. Despite appearances of close friendship, they all seem to be miles apart. And if that's how Varissa feels. I'm sorry about that. I decided to be as frank as possible. I can't imagine how hard it had to be to deal with unwanted advances for so many years. Oh, it's not like that. She shakes her head. Vol, uh, Vol has his moments. There were times when he was actually a sweet wolf. Oh? I raise my brow, not in disbelief. I've actually experienced those moments myself, but out of curiosity to hear more about that hidden side of him. It was when he finally understood that our lives would not add up to a happy ever after. He stopped his obnoxious advances and became a really good friend. It's only recently this stupid infantile infatuation of his re-emerged. Do you know what caused it? I ask, taking another sip. Oh, yes. His designated mate died a year ago. I nearly choke on my drink. I can't even imagine what it feels like to learn that someone you were matched with since childhood suddenly died. I'm so sorry. I blurt out automatically, completely thrown off. He isn't. The female points out with a shrug and my confusion only grows. I'd say he's rather pleased. It has made him free to pursue his own desires. So, uh, here we are. I thought your mating was always planned. Yes, it is. But you can only plan the first one. She states as if it were obvious. After that point, both sides are adults, and although they're expected to continue to mate with others, that's entirely their own affair. So, there's no backup. Why would there be? Rissa shrugs. I mean, yes, if a designated match dies as a pup, then you find a replacement. But Vol's mate died shortly before the coming of age. Set in a what pretty much is an adult wolf with another match, it's both impractical, but also impossible. How so? All wolves have spoken for since birth. There aren't any spares lying about. A female scoffs. Vol losing his mate so close to his coming of age meant that the elders could only sigh in defeat as another wolf slipped through their fingers. He's free to do whatever he likes in that department. It seems a bit cold and uncaring of all to shake off a death of a potential mate so easily. But then again, I guess I was right all along. They're not too keen on their designated hookups. Especially if they have an eye for another. Hmm. I guess the newfound freedom would be why his passions are ignited. Oh, that's just the half of it. She waves a paw, sloshing a drink around the mug. I watch as she empties it, giving me a curious look once the silence protracts. Well, I inquire, what's the other half? I see Tano begins to rub off on you. Why is everyone saying that? I blurt out, quickly reminded of Vol's remark. I'm only trying to get to know them. Perhaps because there's a grain of truth to it. I understand you pretty much have nothing better to do than gossip all day long, but I have work. 
Sorry, didn't mean to pry or make you uncomfortable. Uncomfortable? No, I'm not going to say I didn't enjoy the conversation, but we have more important matters to worry about. The female sighs, standing up. Unfortunately for you, now that you've been out with Vol, it doesn't look good that you no longer working for him. Almost as if he dismissed you, which could also reflect poor poorly on Rannoch. Shit, I haven't even thought about that. The whole ward-warden dynamic. Thankfully, I have some errands that you can assist me with. It looks as if I borrowed you for a day, squashing any potential rumours. And making me the most popular ward in town. I tease and she laughs again. Hey, yes, indeed. What are the errands? Considering Rannoch's mission might be that of a rescue, we have to prepare for the worst. This means wounded wolves. I shudder. Not the answer I wanted to get, but at the same time I guess there's no escape in the cold truth. I need to face the harsh reality of their lives. The sooner the better. I must prepare salves and stock up on herbs. You can help me with that. Of course. I nod eagerly, but quickly my enthusiasm falters. However, I don't know any herbs. Oh, don't worry about that. I wouldn't trust your picking skills anyway. You'll just help me carry them. This basket should do. She points to the one resting next to the hearth. Before I pick it up, I give myself a quick look. The dress is awfully expensive, and Vol did ask me to take good care of it. Should I change? I mean... I splay up my arms, and she chuckles. For what other occasion would you save up a silk dress, if not to frolic in the woods? I know I'm not your wolf of choice when it comes to frolicking, but you'll have to do it with me. I snicker at another of her jabs. Oh, I really don't mind, trust me. Mind? She blinks teasingly. You should be thrilled, but I suppose I have to take what I can get. The female laughs, finally opening the door. I think some fresh air will do you good. So do I, actually. For a moment I consider taking the dandelion with me, but quickly decide not to. I don't want to draw more attention to it than necessary. I simply grab the basket and follow her outside. I find myself staring curiously as she approaches the steps. Is she going to trip, or...? A smile appears on my face as the female jumps over the uneven stone, clearly aware of that little fault. I guess they are all frequent vis visitors to Rannoch's house. I hate to win this, but considering your situation, we should parade through the main village. We need the wolves to see that you are simply working elsewhere. She sighs uncomfortably, proceeding to walk towards the town. Vol really carries a lot of weight in the tribe. We cannot allow us to think you displeased him somehow. Oh, okay. I nod for him beside her. I didn't more than displease him, that's for sure. We stroll slowly, our pace almost unnaturally sluggish, as to give as much time for the passing glances. For it is very intent on us being seen. In truth, it feels rather weird, but also a bit exciting to be shown off like that. I straighten up and ensure my step is dignified. I want my wolf to be proud of his ward. My hand instinctively reaches to Rannoch's crest on the collar. It became quite a comfort, despite me trying my hardest not to enjoy wearing it. Since he departed, I even sleep in it. Considering I didn't take my dandelion with me, it's the best memento I currently have. And much more discreet, that's for sure. Uh, no one's here, good. The female sighs in relief as we pass by Vither's house. I'm not really sure what to make of both hers and Vol's reluctance towards the male. He seems rather fine to me. Any ponderings of that nature are immediately blown away as we enter the main square. To my dismay, we're headed straight for the butchery. I want to ask her what she's doing, but the female beats me to the point. No matter what's going on behind the scenes, we must keep up appearances that you two are fine with each other. While not being on a physical one, I very much feel like a dog pulled by a leash towards a vet. The closer we get, the more I want to break free and run away. With so many eyes on me, all I can do is obediently follow. Of all. She stops at the counter, tapping at it impatiently with her fingers. What? Uh, that little bitch came squealing to you, didn't it? The male snaps almost immediately upon spotting me. 
I know, not really. Uh, should he? Huh? He's caught off guard, giving me a surprised look. I bet he was moaning about. His voice wavers ever so slightly as his eyes dart for a moment to the bruise on my neck. How badly I mistreated him. Again, should he? She reiterates, causing him to give me another confused look. He didn't tell you? Tell me what? That you went overboard during a playful spa? A spa? He's so full of shock he's almost blowing it. I have to intervene, flashing my eyes at him. He just grabbed me into a friendly lock, that's all. I muttered discreetly. A likely excuse to brutalise someone quarter your size. The blood red irises do not lose me from focus even for a moment. His gaze drilling into me for answers. It's called character building. The wolf finally stammers, obviously struggling to understand why I didn't tell on him. Be it as it may, you should have dismissed him like that. It doesn't look good. Rannoch left him in your care, and yet I found him today fed by Cora and watered by Tano. I blink, uncomfortable with her word choice. Um... Wait, that last one came out wrong. But, but you know what I mean. Can't we even trust you with such a trivial thing? She sighs in frustration. You're such an alpha, one would think that looking after a tiny ethergen would not be beyond your capabilities. Fine, I'll make sure he has food from now on. Full spats in annoyance, grabbing a hatchet and turning away. That should go without saying. But it's more than that. You were meant to keep him company. Uh, you always come chewing my ears off. It's almost like your hobby. If it wasn't a piglet, it would been something else. He sneers, chopping off a large piece of meat. Seriously, he needs to learn when to put a sock in it. Never mind. Verissa waves her paws, clearly losing interest in continuing this spat in public. I'm going to play the den, mother, and take care of it, as I take care of everything else. That's my job, rightful. Your words, not mine. He scoffs and she nudges me to move away. Come. We walk at a brisk pace, Marissa clearly trying to get out to the village without running into any more distractions. I'm not dumb, you know. She mutters, giving me a rather displeased look, and I raise my brows in surprise. I know something went down between the two of you, and whatever it was involves that bruise. But... Female sighs reluctantly. I will trust that you know what you're doing, and won't press for details you clearly don't want to give. Just be careful with him. I smile awkwardly, placing a hand on her shoulder in gratitude. She's definitely the more mature of the trio. We continue to meander between many different huts and cottages, the female ensuring we avoid as many passers-by as possible. Eventually the houses give way to grass and shrubs, followed by tall and ancient trees. So we push through the greenery I look back. Seeing enough distance placed between us and the village, I finally feel comfortable enough to speak again. I don't want the conversation to linger on Vol, however, so I'm looking for a change of subject. When Marissa reaches to correct her leather collar, I get an idea for a somewhat natural segue. It's also an opportunity to sate my own curiosity. I was meaning to ask. I mutter, drawing her attention as she bends away one of the low hanging branches. What's that about? I ask idly, nodding towards her neck and causing her to give me a confused look. You're the only wolf I've seen wearing a collar. That's because I'm a ward, just like you. What? I tilt my head in slight disbelief. I serve at behest of our ancestors. I'm at their beck and call. Her voice carries a hint of pride. She caresses a leather strap on her neck. The collar is meant as a reminder of my duty and link to them. Just as yours is a reminder of your duty and link to Rannoch. I touch a true silver crest with a smile. It certainly helps to keep him close, that's for sure. What about your arm? I continue my line of questioning, looking over a get with double curiosity. What about my arm? She muses to a smile, not even regarding me. Most wolves wear some sort of metal band on their right upper arm, but you don't. Does it mean anything? 
I see nothing eludes you. She smirks, giving me a slightly patronising look. Those are arm rings. After the Moonstone, I'd say they're the second most precious possession a wolf can have. Oh? Inquisitive, aren't you? Well, since I'm stuck here, I might as well understand as much as I can about your people. I swat away an insect that flies annoyingly close to my face and she simply chuckles. The rings are made from true silver, but apart from being expensive, they also represent adulthood. But you don't have one. My tone of voice waves as I'm trying to understand the connotation. Does that mean you're not of age? Huh, sneaky. You and Tano would really get along. She stops in her tracks, giving me a suspicious smile and I shrug. I'm simply curious. Heh, to answer your question, I am and I am not. I blink in confusion to which she shakes her head and continues to walk. There are several stages of becoming an adult wolf. First, you claim your name tree when you reach your twelfth year. She veers between the trees, and just as on cue we're passing with an inscription carved deep in its bark. When you're sixteen, you join a pack and claim your place within the tribe. Finally, once you turn eighteen, you're allowed to undertake a great feat, which, if completed, will enable you to claim your armband. A great feat. For males, the great feat is a task tailored by our shaman specifically to test the mantle of a youngling in question. Some have to remain standing in a combat circle for a full day, others have to kill an impressive beast. Some others still have to survive winter in the wilds while they're on their own. I narrow my eyes, immediately wondering what Rannoch's great feat was. Fool's definitely the one who killed an impressive beast. Or perhaps he survived a gruelling gauntlet, standing tall in defiance of all others. I bet that would leave a lasting impression on the tribe, perhaps even explaining why everyone's scared of him shitless. I hope my wolf didn't have to do anything too drastic. But then again, nothing she mentions sounds overly tame. All of this seems incredibly harsh. Rissa ponders my assessment for a moment and nods in reluctant agreement, but her words don't match her concession. Perhaps, but the tribe tries to weed out weakness as early on as possible. At the same time, the feat is never meant to ask more of the wolf than he can possibly accomplish. I feel reluctant posing the question that's on my mind. I don't want to embarrass her. But at the same time, my curiosity is more piqued than before. Rissa seems quite capable, so the lack of a ring is pretty perplexing. So, why didn't you complete your feat? Females are a different matter entirely. We consider of age once our flower blooms. Your flower? Despite her not stopping or facing me, I can see from her form falter slightly, and it's clear she has cringed a little. Please don't make me spell it out for you. Oh, oh, oh! I exclaim in sudden realisation. Oh, okay, uh, I get it. Bees and stalks and such, a conversation every kid and their parent dread. That's why you have sex ed at school, so we can cringe at strangers instead. We walk in the awkward silence of my own making. I should really read more frequently into a poetic license, especially when talking about the embarrassing subject matter. The female stops next to a large tree, touching its bark. She trails the length of her green growth and then checks her paw pads, giving them an idle lick. A young lichen, that should be good. I watch as she retrieves a crude blade and pokes gently at the bark. The key is not to expose the naked wood, otherwise you'll harm the tree. I just want the top layer. She explains, and I nod in understanding. They ain't tree or not, they always revere their forest and treat it with the utmost respect. The female struggles for a moment, but eventually detaches a sizable chunk. She breaks it into smaller pieces, depositing them neatly inside her bag. Once she's done, we're on the move again. I was quite convinced we've abandoned the subject, but that's when she picks it up again. Anyway, males have their great feet decided by a shaman. That's why it's so important that the shaman has both the insight and foresight. She speaks casually, continuing our trek through the wood. However, our great feet was decided by nature a long time ago. According to our customs, there is no greater feat of strength than to give birth. Only once a female has her first litter, she earns her arm ring. 
Simply put, unless you bear pups, you're not really considered an adult she-wolf. I frown uncomfortably. It almost sounds like a soccer mom club. Snobby mothers telling you off and not knowing anything you have no kids. Ah, uh, you don't know what doing laundry means until you have children. Yeah, I hated those. That seems a bit unfair. I mumble, quite confused by this arrangement. I guess. She shrugs. Though, by the way, my mother spoke of it, giving birth does seem like the most horrifying and wonderful thing a female can go through, so I'm not that bothered by any perceived inequality. I can see through a nod, but then another thought hits me. Wait, but you're set up to mate since pups. Why didn't you... you know... I can't believe I actually went there. I struggle to fully verbalise the question, but thankfully she gives me a knowing look and I don't have to. Is your mate not of age? Or is he... like in Vol's case? Oh, he's of age and alive, all right, but there were some uh, complications. She states indifferently. We cannot wait until both sexes go through their coming of age ceremony. Actually, didn't mention the coming of age as part of becoming an adult wolf. Because it's not really, it's more of an affirmation. She holds off an overreaching bush, waving at me to pass through. When you complete your great feat, you only prove that your body reached adulthood. Coming of age is meant to test the spirit as well. Each wolf gets a summon on the eve of their 21st moon. They get cleansed, they meditate, and then receive spiritual guidance. So, Ranoka is 21, give or take. I mean, lunar calendar is a few days short. Again, just like the great feat, the instructions are specific to each wolf. Once undertaken, the coming of age connects us with our ancestors and signifies that we carry their favour. Only then do we become full-fledged members of the tribe. And only then can we mate. We need to be ready body and soul. The female stops to inspect a group of conks sprouting from an old elm. She carefully cuts one off and puts it into a bag. Despite flowering, I still had to wait until I finished my ceremony, but by then I became a shaman. And one of the better perks of becoming anointed by the spirits is that all earthly claims on you become null and void. So, yes, my mate is of age. A bit displeased, I'm sure, but of age. Wait, so why does Vol pursue you then? What do you mean? Isn't it obvious? No, not really. I thought you said being a shaman made you celibate. Oh, move no. She chuckles. It just means I'm the one calling the shots now. I'll mate with whom and when I choose. And this is where we arrive at the other reason behind Vol's reignited infatuation. Shortly after he gained his freedom, that's when our shaman fell ill. More importantly, his actual apprentice at the time was Andalt, and not me. But the shaman had a vision, where the ancestors named me his successor, sidetracking years of training and tradition. The female takes a deep sigh, almost as if it wasn't a pleasant memory. With that one announcement, he's uprooted my entire life. But at the same time, he gave me freedom. Full took it as destiny, clearing a path for us to be together. And you don't? I nearly scoff, confused to hear her say that with such irony. Just because we both got freed from our matches at the same time doesn't mean... Uh, you wouldn't understand. The female waves her paw dismissively, but I just give her a stern look. I understand that you of all wolves should see how crazy of a coincidence that is. Fate or not, I'm not going to ignore who he is. Full is unbearable. As a friend, I couldn't wish for a better wolf at my side, but as a soulmate? She snorts ironically. No. It almost seems like she does feel something towards the male. At least the exasperated disappointment suggests she's not entirely dismissive of him. Full does make for a good companion. He just gets in his way too often to let any good face to bloom. That's because he doesn't know how to show his feelings. I might have drawn her attention. I think he just believes he has to act tough and rough because that's what's what sort of expected of males around here. Even Ranok has his weird attitude that a male has to be all that. If he cares so much about me, then he should know that's not what I expect of him. I need a friend, not a lover. 
With him, it's always one or the other. What if he could be both? I propose a question she nearly chokes. She looks at me stunned for a moment, then lets out a mocking laugh. <laughs> oh, that would be the day. I try to nod in agreement, despite the irony in her voice. I appreciate you speaking of him kindly, especially considering the badge of his esteem you bear on your neck. But one cannot keep explaining away certain behaviours. At some point it just becomes wishful thinking. Or worse yet, enabling. She lets her frown to take over her expression. It lingers and I feel slightly worried that I might have upset her. She quickly banishes the gloom. Anyway, I'm still quite young and have more pressing matters to attend to. I want pups eventually, but I'm in no rush when it comes to romance. I nod with a smile and we continue our walk. She rummages through different shrubs, clearly looking for specific things. Sometimes those are berries, sometimes leaves, or simply just bare stalks. The silence protracts and I keep mulling over our little conversation. Since I don't feel like pushing further into Vol's territory, I decide to entertain my plain curiosity. It's got me thinking. The only way for a female to get an arm ring is to bear pups. What if she turns out barren? Well, I guess you answered your own question. No pups, no arm ring. Rita shrugs. And what if the male is the problem? That's hardly ever an issue, because we mate with multiple partners. A barren male will leave a trail of dissatisfied females. Damn, an answer for everything. I can't help but feel like their sex life has been deprived of a deeper meaning. It seems so systematic, like a process to go through to get your parking validated. Hmm. It's also why a male's first mating is usually quite intense. She throws in randomly, her tail giving an idle flicker almost as if she meant to tease me and I take the bait. What do you mean? I blurt out, trying to stop her blush from creeping onto my face. Well, there's a lot of pressure to make sure that one gets it right the first time. From the gossip, I understand that first time is a very much in demand. The female chuckles as she inspects a bloom she'd found between the roots of a large tree. They keep going at it throughout the day and night, often even creeping into the second evening, all to ensure the deed is done. How is that a good thing? I mumble, not able to imagine a 24-hour sex marathon. Apparently we females are hard to satisfy, so a male that is a long runner is very much a good thing indeed. And just like that I feel extremely flushed. In all honesty, it does sound quite enticing. Rannoch's naked image pops into my mind, and all I can think about is him claiming me for hours on end. After all, as Vol said himself, Rannoch has stamina. Shit. She notices the shift in my heart rate and laughs. I knew you'd find the subject interesting. I look away as she kneels next to another shrub, picking through some leaves and cutting away certain branches. I mean, it's human nature, right? She blinks. I'd say just nature, but I know what you mean. I try to rein in my runaway train of thought and bring myself back to the conversation with my dignity intact. It sounds as if the length of the mating is born more of a desperation than passion. It's a mixture of both. Rissa concedes, still rummaging through the shrubbery. I mean, the males are 21 before they get to wet their wicks. There's a lot of pent-up energy there, surely you've noticed. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. I nearly yelp out, the pride she keeps pushing my buttons and the female laughs, standing up. Oh, I'm sure you're sure what I mean. She crooned seductively, lifting my chin with a paw. Run not get excited at the slightest of touch, full going mental over anything that has to do with me. They're all on edge. Oh, yeah. I mumble. I get it now. Mm-hmm. She teases one last time, finally continuing our walk through the woods. But yes, I suppose there is a bit of desperation as well. I mean, no male wants to walk out of his first mating without father and pups. That sort of a mishap leads to unfortunate rumours which are awfully hard to wash off. Even if he eventually sighs a pup. I ask, slowly managing to lower my own excitement. The more clinical this conversation becomes, the better. Well, supposedly a male failed with two females and suddenly succeeds with a third. She poses her own question. 
This kind among the tribe, my question was actually he who finally accomplished the task. That sort of thing stays with the male for the rest of his life. Rissa admits uncomfortably, kneeling next to a small clump of mushrooms. So all in all, we females don't have the bad end of the stick. There is no doubt if the pup is ours. She plucks a few of them, giving an idle sniff. All of this sounds so incredibly wrong. Mm -hmm. She ponders, standing up and giving me a telling look. I'm not trying to be judgy. I protest, lifting my hands up. I'm just trying to understand your culture. What you say is just a self-perpetuating system that's driven by fear and paranoia. In fact, it prevents you from considering your true feelings and attachments because your reputation is at stake. Well, when you put it that way, I suppose you're right. She shrugs, turning away and approaching another bush. How else would you put it? I ask as she looks between the leaves, picking at oval red berries. I mean, even you yourself admitted you're glad to be outside of it, capable of making that call when you want and with whom you want. Deep down you know it's how it's supposed to be. I wouldn't go that far. She flutes indifferently, still focused on her task. True, it's nice to have a sense of agency from time to time. But if I were forced to mate with my intended, I would have pups by now. That wouldn't be the worst outcome, would it? The female finally faces me with a weak smile for an emphasis behind her question. And once I had that out of the way, I'd find time to seek love and companionship. Just as countless wolves did before me. As it happens right now, neither motherhood nor a soulmate are at the top of my priorities, so all possible outcomes are entirely indifferent to me. She shrugs, giving me something to think about. I guess she really does look at things from a wider perspective. It's nearly impossible not to admire her stoicism, although I struggle to understand it. Mm -hmm. For someone so young, and you are young, both body and soul, you misplace a lot of your attention on romantic feelings. Versa reiterates, looking deep into my eyes. You're without memories, away from home amongst creatures, you see for everything but what they truly are, your enemies. Your life is on the line, Sam. I swallow heavily, so her voice takes on a rather serious tone. I suggest you rid yourself of all childish notions in the nearest future. It will help us all a great deal. She laughs me off and proceeds to walk deeper into the forest. Despite feeling foolish, I try not to show it and walk briskly next to her. The woods become denser and darker as a thick canopy above us acts like a blanket. Bruce is clearly on the lookout for some herbs, a task in which I have little to contribute. The protracting silence begins to grate on me, and I consider her last words carefully. Instead of focusing on triviality, I need to think more about our current predicament. I decide to touch upon a matter I meant to discuss with them for a while now. Speaking of something that could help us a great deal, I recently discovered I speak different languages. Yes, Wolven being the prime example. She teases, shaking her head. No, I mean, I don't know how to explain this, but I don't hear other languages, but rather... Ugh. The female takes a stop and gives me a curious glance. They all blend into one. What do you mean? So you know how you hear Wolven, right? Yes. That's how all languages sound to me. Huh? She sounds confused. The chief at the feast, I understood what he's saying in those human languages. Granted, I assumed you would. I met with a shrug. You are a human after all. No, you don't get it. I tried to figure out how to best spell it out for her and I remember my exchange with Trist. Uncertain if I should spill that little nugget of information or not, I hesitate for a moment. I mean, we did make a truce and throw him under a bus like that doesn't seem, to, doesn't seem like me keeping to my end of the bargain. Reluctantly, I decided to keep my knowledge of Sylvan to myself for the time being. I'm not sure what paranoia could feed into the hearts of these wolves. Perhaps they'd think I am a spy. But the human languages should be enough to convince her. When he spoke human, it sounded exactly the same as Wolven does. In fact, either human dialect sounded the same. Hmm. She thinks for a moment, looking rather perplexed. Despite her collected outward appearance, I can see she's struggling with the concept. Isn't it how multilingual people function? What? Now I'm the one thrown off, blinking at a question. 
I mean, I don't even know how speaking another language works. Wolven is all I know. I never had the need to learn another language. Doesn't it auto-translate into your mother tongue in your head? Huh? I'm stumped. I mean, yes, sort of. I get increasingly confused, not even accounting the possibility that she doesn't speak any other language. But you should be able to tell the difference, even if you subconsciously understand the meaning behind the words. They're not the same. But you do understand them subconsciously, she points out. By your own admission, that's how it works, right? I guess. My conviction falters. She's going to rationalise it, isn't she? I still shouldn't hear them as one and the same. But how do you know if it's not the other way around? Perhaps it's the wolven that sounds to you like your mother tongue. I, uh... I mean, she isn't wrong, but doesn't make her right either. I'd say it's just confusion caused by the trauma that's behind your memory loss. Your mind is trying to make sense of more important matters than language barriers, so it skips them. She shrugs and continues to walk away, obviously of letting me know she's done with the subject. But, I sigh, I guess. I'm surprised by her dismissiveness, but without revealing I speak Sylvan, there's little chance to make her reconsider. And since she's the most reasonable of the trio, I doubt I'll have any more luck with either Rana or Vul. Defeated, I shake my head and decide to simply enjoy the stroll for what it's worth. I watch as she inspects different growths, picking through their leaves and berries. She places some of the greenery into my basket and the silence continues. As it drags on, I begin to feel rather uncomfortable. Desperate for another topic, I think back to the morning exchange between Cora and Tano. It got me curious about the relationship between the White Wolf and Rannoch. There's one more thing I was meaning to ask you. A lucky me. This morning, when I was in Tano's and Cora's company, quite inadvisably, I might I add, she interjects with a clearly displeased tone. Well, they talked about him and Rannoch, about their friendship and eventual falling out. Hmm? I can see she feigns interest and surprise, clearly wanting me to continue with the query without having to add anything unprompted. I was just wondering, why did they fall out? And you're asking me this because... You're Rannoch's friend, are you not? I am. She stops, giving me a quite perplexed look. And that is why I hold my peace on matters that do not concern me. If you wish to know what happened, and should he want to divulge, that is his story to tell. Unless you mean to ask Tano. The female shrugs mockingly. Otherwise it's just hearsay. Despite being sassy with me on occasion, it's the first time I see her being this touchy. Almost if Rannox and Tano's falling out was more than just that. My curiosity aside, I decide not to confront her further and just drop it. Although it's good to know she keeps her friend's confidence. It makes me ashamed that I even asked. In truth, I'd definitely rather hear this from Rannock. Conversation going nowhere, I just observe as she goes about her business picking different herbs and explaining their names as we continue. Yarrow, rosemary, salvia and silverleaf. All meaning very little to me, but being quite important to her work. I try to pay attention as much as I can as I deposit them into my basket. My simple mind can only handle so little. They're just green leaves to me, aside from an occasional clump of moss or a shroom. Witch elm is apparently important for healing ointments like the one used on my stab. She wedges her rusty but trusty blade into the bar to gain, gain another few chips, as well as harvest some leaves. Could you look around for moss? The female asks idly, continuing to pick through the branches. Sure. I nod, walking off some distance and checking various trees. Not far off, I find a tall birch covered with a green growth. Here's this one, okay? I call out and she leans from behind her witch helm. Not sure what's so witchy about it. Looks like a regular tree to me. I know, that's not the one I'm looking for. I need moon moss or swan's neck, preferably both. Burissa grumbles, struggling with the more stubborn part of the elm's limbs. Yeah, that tells me a lot. Moon moss is blue in tint and has small white polyps at the end of each stalk. A swan's neck. She huffs. Has fern like leaves with stalks bent in the shape of a swan's neck. That's the name. I chuckle, seeing her fall onto a rump as the branch finally gives way. 
Despite initial confusion, I quickly managed to locate what I assume was moon moss, very much as she described, blue with white dots specking its surface. I think I've got it. Good job. I can hear her strained breath as she carries a sizable heap of leaves towards me. She dumps them into the basket and inspects my find. Real good job. Her voice takes on a more impressed tone. I think this one's just sprouting. That's good. That's excellent. She perks up her tongue in a determined fashion and begins cutting at the roots of the growth. When she has her fill, the female looks around to find our bearing. Really, all to be needed is some swan's neck, but it isn't that much of a deal. Let's take a roundabout way back into the village and count for a lucky streak, hmm? Sounds good to me. I smile and proceed to follow her lead. In all fairness, I'm very confused when it comes to our bearing, so having her as a guide is quite a comfort. As we walk through the thickets, I can't help but wonder about all the different plants and berries spurning about. I'm sure it's too cold for them, although the forest does make it feel as if it's much warmer than I think. I cannot help but notice. Have you actually tried? She snorts, mocking my constant vigilance, but I decide to ignore the jab. The, the plants here, aren't they a bit anachronic? My, someone ate a whole dictionary for breakfast. The female continues her teases and I chuckle. I mean, they're slightly out of time, no? It is early spring. Tiernan is very uh, specific like that. Marissa responds, pushing away some shrubs to create a safer trail of my bare feet. It springs to life relatively quickly after winter and plants here are governed by their own rules. To us it's just normal, but I don't understand it's quite unusual elsewhere. She shrugs, setting over a large fallen trunk. Some call Tiernan the farthest part of the Everspring woods. Everspring? I ask, stopping beside her as she's looking beneath the log for some additional specimens. Yes, it's an enchanted forest ruled over by the lynxkin to the very far north of Avalan. But it's just poetic comparison. Both woods are far apart and have nothing in common. Her voice wavers as she strains to reach something from underneath. Why is it called Everspring? It is said to, to be in a state of a, a, perpetu a perpetual bloom. The female finally huffs, pulling a handful of small mushrooms. Sounds magical. And boring. Autumns here are quite something, I can tell you. She muses while dusting off her dress and entering a more energetic step. As we pass through another thicket, I notice a large swath of purple flowers that I'm sure I recognise. I think about picking a few when she suddenly grabs my hand. What are you doing? I wanted to pick some lavender to take home. It's not that the cabin smells or anything, but it'd be a nice change of ambience. That's no lavender. The female frowns, releasing my hand. That's wolfsbane, deadly poisonous. What? I jump away, honestly, if I would be bitten by a viper. Don't worry, simply touching it won't cause you much harm, but you better not mess around with it. Damn, it looks so pretty. I could have sworn it looks like lavender. Easy mistake to make, perhaps. She concedes but a serious one nonetheless. A bundle of lavender will ease you to sleep. A bundle of wolfsbane will send you to the great beyond. Yeah, no thanks. I mumble awkwardly, rubbing my arm. I should definitely stay away from picking herbs any time soon. That's wild lavender. She points in a different direction to a bunch of green stalks in the distance, but those are barren. Marissa quickly picks up on my confusion. It's not the season for it. Lavender is a late summer bloom. Huh. Yeah, you better not mess with our flora unsupervised. She laughs me off and invites me to walk beside her. We continue meandering through the thickets, but despite our detour, we don't stumble upon Swan's Neck. I make extra sure to inspect every moss patch we find, regardless of her protests and resignation. I would be useful for something. Then she will arrive at the main square and she picks the wicker basket from my hand. I'd better head back and get these sorted. I'll check on you in the evening before the feast, if that's all right. Sure. I won't be able to stay long, though, so don't get your expectations high. I won't. I chuckle and brush her off. Maybe my heart does sing a little, so I'll have to spend the rest of the day alone. I won't let her know that. 
Just a lot on her mind, if any of this harvest is meant to create some sort of panacea of the wounded, if there will be any wounded, I'd rather have her at it as soon as possible. Head straight to the cottage and don't stop for anything. We really don't need to draw any more attention, you have a tendency to do just that. I nod and simply rush off, my silk dress swooshing on the wind. There's no reason for me to run, but I really want to get out of sight, especially since more and more gazes land on me. So past different wolves, they express their unhappiness with me being out and about. Where's the fire? Calls one I nearly bumped into. You are covering your letter than attended, now the monkey's running wild. Another jab from a complete stranger, but I don't mind. Out of six alphas in this trial, I have confidence of three and curiosity of the fourth. I'd say I'm doing pretty fine, thank you very much. It doesn't take long to reach the house and I jump over the steps. It's good to be home. Once I close the doors behind me, I take a deep breath and try to relax. The walk in the woods was both insightful and invigorating, as pretty much all exchanges I had with Arissa to date. Quite parched due to our stroll, I take a mug and dunk it into the barrel. I really need a drink. Flopping comfortably into the chair, I simply sip and unwind thinking about the crazy two days I had so far. Despite missing Ranak a whole lot, plenty enough is going on to keep my mind occupied and buzzing with activity. From Vol's infatuation and childish outburst to Tano's curiouser and curiouser past with Ranok. Cora's apparent sadness that they're falling out and Varissa's evasiveness on the matter only add to the mystery. There's so much to think about and my imagination runs wild. Could Tano be Ranok's first crush? I'd explain his little back and forth at the feast. But then again, how would Tano take away Ranok's happiness? If they were an item, was it their heart-wrenching breakup or a storied betrayal? I snort on my wild theories. It almost feels as if I've suddenly slipped from a fairy tale territory into Spanish soap operas. Despite how exciting the speculation is, I do find it quite disturbing that Ranox and Tano's feud seem to run deeper than just the superficial. Friends or lovers? I'm not sure how I feel about deep bonds like that severed so completely. Especially if it's over something stupid. And knowing Ranok, it definitely was something stupid. Three years means they were still just teens. Well, they didn't deny my wolf any credit. He is quite patient. He also tends to dance around the truth a whole lot. With love or friendship, that's never a good practice, especially if one is stubborn to admit wrongdoing in the first place. Then again, Tano is a very underhanded and sneaky guy. Maybe he fucked Ranok over one time too many. My wolf is quite principled. Being constantly let down definitely would not sit well with him. Unless it was really more than that. I wonder if they... No. I've been getting exceedingly distracted by the horny stuff while here. It's none of my business if they did stuff or not. I just want to be caught in a crossfire. Tano seems like a wolf you really do not want to piss off unintentionally. I try to keep myself occupied by tidying up the place, washing up the used up dishes and making sure the cottage is presentable for when Ranok finally returns. Because he will return. I just know it. In the meantime, to keep my spirits up, I'll just think of all the conversations we can have once he's back. The idea of all the answers I can get makes me quite excited. Exciting enough to steal my resolve against any pervasive thoughts. I simply pet my dandelion and drift away on a daydream to the moment I'll see that goofy wolf again. Eventually it gets sufficiently dark that I realise my musings have taken me into the evening. With very little left to do, drifting off and overthinking stuff is pretty much all I have. And that's not good. I start out the fire and simply heat up one of the pies in a small pan. I save the meal as much as I can, but between the warmth of the hearth, the food and the ale, I begin to drift off. A soft knock on the door stirs me up from my stupor and I rush to open the doors. Hey there, pet! Cora catches me by surprise and I blink in confusion towards Marissa's bemused muzzle. Clearly the curious female followed her here, intent on going to the feast together. Well, go on! The tawny girl is overly excited and gets me increasingly curious and awake. Finally, Varissa rummages inside of her bag and places the pinkish-looking bar onto the table. With soap! She elongates her speech as if she's talking to a child. We're washing up! Now she follows up with a pantomime consisting of rubbing her own tits and pits. 
I give a discreet glance of Arissa, much an heroic expression. Oh, it smells of flower. Uh, please don't. Finally, the white female grabs one of her paws. He's not a kid, not a moron. Oh, sorry. Cora mutters awkwardly and readjusts her expression. Or oh, just smell it. She grabs the bar and takes a sniff, inviting me to do the same. I shrug and decide to entertain her. It smells of lavender. I blink, looking to the white female. I had some dried florets and found an old recipe. Wasn't hard to make, just needed some tallow. She shrugs, causing Cora to scoff in amusement. I know how to make soap fee. She blurts out through a snort and I sigh internally. Of course she does. She's cute, nice, somewhat smart and handy. I was talking. Marissa cuts off, rolling her eyes in annoyance. To myself. Oh, you and your rest. You overwork yourself. Cora waves her paw and ruffles my hair. Well, anyway, pity we have to leave him here, but we'd better go. I don't want to get another scolding from Aldris. Yeah, yeah, you go ahead and I'll just check in on something. Okie dokie. See you later, Bet. We wait watching as Cora steps outside and Marissa leans in with a whisper. Stay put. I nod, holding up the pinkish bar. Uh, thanks for this, V. I tease her with this newfound nickname. Uh, don't you start. I made it to give you a little taste of her warrocks away. I assumed you wanted lavender for toiletries and Ronald did mention he talked about soap earlier. He did. I blink, again taken aback by his constant thoughtfulness. It's better you wash up using this than take an accidental bath in Wolfsbane. That would not be pleasant. She snorts, causing me to shake my head. Either way, I'd better go. It's much more brief than I'd hoped, but such is life. Oh, don't worry, I get it. I nod and embrace her, causing the female to stumble slightly in shock. For a moment I think I've crossed the line, but she reassures me by returning the hug. Stay put. She reiterates before taking her leave. When she's out, I just bounce the bar on my hand well and then place it on the cupboard. I'm thinking of using it now for a moment, but considering how tired I've gotten, washing up would just wake me up. I'm not about to spend a lonely night in this empty house awake. Instead, I drink a deep cup of water, pet my dandelion and put the fires out. As I pass the rack, I pick up one of Rannock's cloaks and take it with me to the bedroom. There I pull off the dress, fold it neatly onto the chest and slip into the linen. Once I'm comfortably splayed out, I snuggle into the cloak and inhale deeply, trying to remind myself of his scent. With at least a shred of his presence, I feel safe and snug, slowly drifting off into an effortless dream. Oddly enough, no whispers come to interrupt it, and I couldn't be gladder. I simply surrender to the memory of my wolf, who thanks for his cloak almost feels as if he's embracing me. For the first time, I truly sleep in, waking up all natural. I mean, it's not like Rannoch didn't let me laze a bit before, but I still woke up early on his account. Now, without the wolf, there's no real reason to get up at dawn. Not to mention there's not much else to do around here. I'm kind of done with reading books for the time being. The last two left me unsettled enough as it is. I take a long stretch and approach the window to see the weather outside. I rest against the sill and take in the view. It's a sunny day as most of the ones before, but still quite chilly. Another way around it. Better get started. I go into the kitchen to build a fire. With a total of three attempts under my belt, I think I'm getting better at this. Once the warmth of the hearth radiates across the kitchen, I put on the lever, hoping it'll cause the metal chain to descend from the chimney. It does, to my great relief. I mount the cauldron onto the chain and fill it with water and leave it to boil. Those morning hoops to jump through are quite bothersome. It makes me appreciate so many things I might have taken for granted. Indoor plumbing being at the top of the list. I decide to take my time with washing myself, especially since I've gone through all this trouble to get some warm water. I scrub every inch diligently, using the bar of silver Rissa gave me. It foams between my hands and I bring it to my face to take a few sniffs. 
The smell of lavender is a very new but also welcome addition to my bathroom routine. More so than scrubbing myself with ash, that's for sure. Once I'm done and dry, I look around for some quick breakfast. After the circus with heat in my own bath, I don't feel like making any fry up. I still have some leftovers from yesterday, so I'm not that worried. However, as I'm about to sit down, I hear a knock on the door. Before answering, I drape myself over with one of Rannoch's spare cloaks. Once nicely covered, I open the doors, only to find a small linen parcel laying at my feet. I look out onto the porch and notice Fool's back in the distance as he casually walks off without even saying hello. Hell, he doesn't even look back. So, we're playing this game then. Ugh. I pick up the package and close the door, flipping it carelessly onto the table. He's such an immature prick. He was the one to choke me. Again! I decide to be the bigger man and not take it personally, and he's the one to get offended. I'm so annoyed that I grab a tangled and walk towards the barrel. I fill it up and sit back at the table. I don't even want his damned food anymore. My frustration grows with each passing moment as I sulk and wet my lips with ale. He was the one to break the damn promise. I get it. He's extremely possessive. I see some of that behaviour in Rannoch, but fuck. I sure hope my wolf doesn't end up acting like this. They're all savage beasts! Immediately think of Rhea. No, no. I shake my head, picking up on the invasive thought. That was different. Drea trackled his superior in his own house. Worse yet, could have very much ended up with my death. Rannoch might have overreacted, but he was justified. He wasn't nowhere near as insane as tackling me because of a slip of the tongue. Boris is right. That wolf is crazy. He swore! Oathbreaker! Yes, he swore on his... No. No! I jump up to my feet. I'm not Dorothy for you to fuck with. My rattled breath echoes across the room. I try to stabilise myself, knowing full well whatever the hell the thing is, it very much latches onto my emotions and cranks them up to eleven. I look back to the table, reaching for the dandelion resting in the cup. I pick up the soft flower and bring it close to my nose, inhaling gently. My wolf is my compass. You cannot change that. He's got... No. I say calmly, managing the thought for it even materialises. I know your games. You mistake me for a pawn, but I'm very much intent on remaining a player. If I can keep my cool while deep inside of a wolf den, then your incorporeal ass can kiss mine. I sit back down, still very much toying with my keepsake. Vol is vol. I saw his terror as he realised he broke his promise. Even if he doesn't care for me, I saw in his eyes that shame of someone who very much holds his word dear. An honourable wolf who wounded his own pride. He didn't intend it. It only happened because she means the world to him. Irene lays a heavy sigh, venting out all that pent-up anger. He's just as lost as Rannoch is, if not more. Deep down he resents the idea of being seen as a beast and a brute. They made him into this. This fucking tribe. It's like a machine is designed to twist and bend everyone inside of it till all that comes out are damaged souls. If I'm to stay here, I'm going to make sure I don't become a cog inside of it. I won't perpetuate hurt and distrust. Everyone deserves a second chance. Especially the Black Wolf. I spend maybe an hour or two trying to unwind with the ale. I even check out the parcel that Vol brought, letting go of my petty grudge. There's some more cheese, sausages, or looks like a nice quiche I'm pretty sure he made himself. It almost feels like a makeup gift. Or maybe I'm reading into things again. Either way, it's better to hold on to hope than resentment. I still struggle reading time in this place. I'm sure it's somewhere past noon, gauging by how high the sun in the sky is. The fire already died out and I used my free time to quickly clean the house again, trying to stay away any pervasive thoughts. Although I know much easier task thanks to me finally picking up on their foreign nature, they still unnerve me a little. It's like having another person inside of me. Bringing the cottage up to speed isn't as laboursome as I did a fairly good job of it the first time around. I simply dust the surfaces and sweep the floors, careful to get into every nook and cranny. There's no satisfaction in keeping this place tidy. 
Once only the bedroom's left, I begin to wonder what I'll do with the rest of the day. Oh, thank heavens. I put down the broom, certain it's Verissa coming to pay me a visit. I rush towards the chest where on the dress, trying to make the female wait. I'm coming, I'm coming. I mutter in my mind, straightening the silk across my thighs. As I open the door, I almost jump back in panic. Triss just stands there looking at me with a bemused expression, most likely taking my startled reaction as mockery. He nods towards the inside, clearly asking to be let in. I just shut the door in his stupid face. But the bunny persists. Ah. I open again, this time begrudgingly giving him a nasty look. One more time the bunny nods towards the inside, asking to be let in. I glance around, seeing some wolves about, and reluctantly wave my hand in an inviting gesture. The moment the door is shut, I give him the meanest stink I can muster. What you want? I came to fetch you, he states matter-of-factly. Fetch me? You must be kidding. Yes, as much as I think you are a massive joke, this here isn't. Ooh, you little... Funny coming from someone called Kaelin. So, you do speak their language. Oh, clearly not as well as you do. He scoffs, walking towards the table and dragging his finger across it. I mean, what sort of idiot wouldn't pick up a few words working here for several years? Then why pretend? Because wolves do not like being spoken to. He throws an inquisitive gaze into the floor, rubbing it with his hind paw. I see Rannox already putting you to good use. Or perhaps I'm just not a lazy layabout. He grimaces, massaging his forehead as if he were in pain. Ugh. What's the matter? I ask automatically, my good nature overriding my dislike for the guy. Nothing's the matter, just it's so confusing talking with you. It's like... Yeah, yeah, like has born in your burrow. I scoff mockingly. I've heard that one already. He gives me a distrusting look and simply shakes his head. Either way, I'm not here to debate your linguistic skills. Good. If you want bonus points, you can stop scrutinising my housework as well. As if I'd care about my standing with an obvious spy. I laugh out loud, looking at him with pity. A spy? Who the hell would I spy for? You tell me. A smug smile stretched across his muzzle. His insolence has finally exhausted my patience. I have an annoyance approaching the door. They creak open as I swung them ajar, showing the rabbit out. Leave. Now. Close the damn door, you fool. The bunny jumps up in panic, causing me to narrow my eyes. Someone can overhear us. I comply reluctantly, slowly closing the door. Why are you so freaked out? We're talking in Sylvan. We're talking, period. Wolves don't like their wards plotting behind closed doors. We're hardly plotting. Try to explain that to them. I sigh uncomfortably, not really sure how much I can really trust this guy. Again, what do you want? I was ordered to fetch you. You're needed at the villa. At the villa? I blink. Yes. But I'm supposed to stay here, out of sight. Well, the chief is throwing the luncheon for the elders. Surely his household is well staffed. What does he need me for? I don't know. It was Vither's idea. What? Why? I only understand bits and pieces of that horrid language. Something about making an impression. On the elders? I conclude and the bunny scoffs mockingly. Yeah, I suppose. Sometimes I think a single tree would have more guile than all those damn wolves combined. Bringing you in there is just asking for trouble, especially decked out like this. He waves at my dress and I look down at it. I mean, it is a dress, but other than that, nothing seems to be wrong with it. It's not revealing or anything. I'd much rather be in it than walking around half naked. Besides, why should I even go anywhere with him? I'm Rannoch's attendant, not a servant. I shrug. Would you care to explain that to the chief, then? He proposes, show me the door. Very funny. I thought so. He flashes his brows with satisfaction and approaches the exit. I don't like all this. Of all the people in here, why they send Trist? I don't want to go, especially not with you. Trust me, I don't want you anywhere near me, either. Especially when that poorly mass ploid rose explodes in your muzzle. And it will, I assure you. 
I don't want to be caught in the blast by association. He pulls on the handle and cracks the door slightly open, inviting me to follow. What ploy? Whatever chagrin you have going on, I want no part in it. But this is not a request, it's an order. Now would you please, Moby, for this in guards after us? I sigh and concede. Fine. Although I am distrustful of the bunny, I doubt he would try anything stupid. He seems quite afraid of what the tribe is capable of, and I'm under their protection. I walk towards the door with a reluctant step. This is quite the opposite of laying low. In all fairness, when did any of Rannoch's plans unfold in the way he intended? It is a lovely day outside, and the air is much warmer than before. I sigh, glancing over the table with a smile. Once this errand is over, and if the weather holds, I'll have myself a nice drink here in the evening. Triss pulls me out of my daydream by rushing past me towards the path. I'm about to follow when I notice the bunny stumble and almost fall into the dirt, cursing under his breath. Wolf damn step! I try not to laugh, for a chuckle escapes my lips. Someone will lose their teeth on it one day. Makes me wonder how often he actually left the place. Do you think that an even step would make rather a lasting impression? I jump over the faulty stone and stop next to the flustered bunny. I'd imagine for a long time attending you'd be used to it. it. Took me only a day to. Listen, it's better you shut up in public. It won't improve your chances if they learn you speak old Sylvan as well. I tisk snarkily. Ah, oh, you worry. Of course I do. You're suspicious as it is. Last thing I need is your stink being traced back to any of us. Now, let's go. He waves his paw at me and we walk down the footpath leading towards the centre of the village. There's a lot of movement this time around, mainly because it's midday. The wolves we pass give us unsettling looks, some very eager to bear their fangs in subdued growls. While we're out without Rannock, we're walking targets. Best to keep our heads low. He mutters and I comply, blocking my gaze in the path in front of me. I suddenly feel very much exposed, their penetrating gaze is sending the wrong kind of shivers down my spine. My breath speeds up to match the tempo of my racing heart. This sort of hostility is something I'm not used to. Why do all the charm and the feasting go? Relax, that's what they're after, to startle you. The bunny sighs and I try to steal myself. Those brutes look for any excuse to send a prey kid into panic. Don't give them the satisfaction. I frown, finding it hard to believe even though I'm experiencing it first hand. Then again, Walter's get a weird kick out and settling me. Maybe it's Rana who's the odd one out. As we enter the centre of the village, I glance over the butchery. Unsurprisingly, it's up and running with Vul busy at work with his back turned towards us. I want to end our little spat and decide to approach. It's also a good idea to let him know I'm being led somewhere. What are you doing? Tris whispers me in panic by ignoring with a shrug. I approach a counter and pat at it, drawing Vul's attention. Ah, oh, Piglet! He looks rather surprised, but his expression is less sour than I expected. What? He cuts off, noticing Triss dragging behind me. I've got that he doesn't know the bunny is in on our little secret. Just as the awkward silence falls upon us, I see Cora walk from around the corner. I give her a shy wave, sending Triss into a deeper shock. Why, hello there, pet. Aren't you looking a picture? She smiles widely at me, while giving Trist an averse glance. What are you two up to? I was wondering the same thing. Wool interjects. You, where take him? The wolf points at me, making an exaggerated hand swing into the distance. I watch as Trist runs his paws behind his head, almost as feeding up an invisible wreath. He then joins him in front of his chest, mimicking the sloped roof. A chief's place? Why? The bunny shrugs. I really struggle not to laugh at this whole charade. Oh, he'll be fine. He's got Rana's crest on his collar. I'll treat him right. She winks at me, ruffling my hair. Anyway, I need two pounds of fresh ham and some sausages for the den. We're making a stew for the pups. I need something hearty. Will gives me an approving look. You're in luck. Piglet and I made some fresh ones the other day. Oh, did you now? She looks to me with a kind smile. How industrious. Well then, I cannot wait to try them. 
She finally addressed his role properly and the blackmailer has no choice but return to conducting his business. Triss seizes this opportunity to pull me away with a rather angered expression. I look back, worried about our hasty departure. The wolves seem to pay us no mind. While we're a safe distance away, the bunny finally snaps at me. Your carelessness is going to get us both killed. He scolds me and I give him a confused look. Don't acknowledge any wolf unless they acknowledge you first. And never give your attention to low-ranking wolves in the presence of an alpha. I narrow my brows. Their social norms are so much different to what I'm used to, and are aided by my personal rapport with Wool and the others. I guess I really need to up my game if I want to be inconspicuous. Sorry, it's all new to me. Uh, seriously. He sneers. Volker is the last wolf you want to fuck with. Or one of the first, depending on your meaning. I chuckle, trying to ease him. The bunny is clearly unsettled. It's not a joke. If you want to get killed, do so in your own time. But don't drag me down with you. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. I'll try to keep their customs in mind. He sighs, looking at me with doubt. What about the elders? How do they rank in this society? See, doing we're heading into the valley, you better give me a crash course. He nods in agreement as we walk around the stockades. I want to end up here due to some slip up. The hierarchy is quite simple. Chief is at the top, you always acknowledge the chief. Then comes his advisor, in this case, Vitha. Yeah, that makes sense. After that, it's the elders, any and all of them. Only then you acknowledge the heir. Ranog. I whisper and the bunny nods. After the heir, it's the alphas in no specific order. If any of them are present, no one else exists. It's a grave insult to acknowledge a lower-ranking wolf before finishing with their superior. I guess me interacting with Koro is another no-no, then. So far, nearly everything is a grave insult with these wolves. You don't even know the half of it. He mutters, pulling my hand. Come on, pick up the pace. We walk a little further, my feet relieved to feel undergrowth again, as the small pebbles of the village pathways quite hurt my soles. I notice we're not exactly walking on grass, but rather a moss-covered road. It's incredibly ancient by the look of it, and cuts right into the thick of the woods. I stop in my tracks, absolutely amazed by the way the canopy arches above the trail, creating an illusion of a woodland tunnel, pierced every now and then by an occasional light shaft reaching to the ground from high above. Wow, this looks amazing. I gasp in astonishment, trying to take in this spectacular view. It's a bit overgrown. The rabbit shrugs unenthusiastically. That's what's beautiful about it. Heh. <laughs> Finally a shred of emotion other than the scowl. You might think I didn't notice him giving me curious glances, but I did. It seems he approves of my appreciation for nature. It's an old sylvan road. It connects all the major groves to Tiernan. Groves? I inquire, trying to seize the opportunity to build a proper rapport with the guy, but I might have acted too hastily. Trist only gives me a contemptuous look, deciding to ignore my question. Fine, don't tell me. I pout, placing my hands behind my head and giving myself an idle stretch. I assume they're important to the Sylvan folk. Uh, is that your game? To gather information? He sneers, giving me an accusatory look. I'm only asking questions, trying to understand what's going on. What's going on is I don't buy a little damsel in distress act. I'm not a damsel. I narrow my eyes and the bunny scoffs. Sorry, but I got confused by your fancy dress. Could you at least not be this difficult? I ask, rolling my eyes in annoyance. It's entirely unnecessary. We both survive amongst these walls. We have to stick together. Together? Triss blinks and stops in his tracks. Oh, no, he wins. He hisses, pushing his finger into my chest, deep enough to cause me to wince. I intend to stay as far away from possible from you, because you... I watch as he waves that finger in front of me, struggling to find the right words. You are just a delayed death sentence in the making. Why are you being so bitter? I haven't done anything to you. I ask, really not understand his animosity now that we have a chance to talk. I don't find it being helpful to either of us. Haven't you now? Again, he sneers mockingly. Aside from taking my position, you are literally threatening to set this place ablaze. I didn't take it. Well, intentionally, at least. If it was up to me, you could have it back. 
My voice carries a cynical note. Like, how could he pin this on me? The claim I have some sinister intentions towards the tribe. It's insane. I am not a threat. Not a threat? You must be joking. Triss sneers and I just sign resignation, pushing right past him. I might not know where the villa is, but we're on this road for a reason, right? Suit yourself. Silence overtakes us as we continue our journey. We march for maybe five or ten minutes, but they drag on mercilessly. The only entertainment I have is watching the bunny fume over our exchange. He's definitely thinking of a comeback, and no sooner than I begin to smirk his perpetual scowl, he breaks the silence. What would the human even be doing this far from any of his kin? Like, honestly, what is your goal here? I'm just lost, Trist. I've been saying this the whole time. Yeah, yeah, as if anyone would buy it. Sooner or later, they'll figure out what you're up to. Who will? The elders, the chief. He shrugs. Why else would Vitha want you there? Without Rana covering your back, it's a prime opportunity to actually sniff you out. They'll make quick work of you and things will be able to go back to normal. And this time there's no Rana to save you. He says in a cold, heartless tone. Doesn't seem like he's joking. I slow down my pace, starting to think again this might just be a trap. What are you doing? He notices my tardiness as I finally come to a stop. You really are afraid, huh? Trish smiles with satisfaction, not knowing when to stop. Got yourself in too deep? Why are you being such a dick? Being nice was nowhere in my job description. He mocks me and looks forward towards our destination. We need to get a move on, you're lagging behind. The bunny demands, but I don't care. Instead I look behind, in the direction of the village. I was supposed to stay in the house. I think I'm going to head back. Back? Are you insane? He shouts out, approaching me hastily. You do not ignore someone from the chief, especially when elders are involved. Rannock told me to stay put, but you dragged me out and put me in direct danger. What? He looks at me with shock. This has nothing to do with me. He protests, darting his worried gaze between the road ahead of us and me. Look, I'm sorry I have upset you, but you cannot head back. If they have to look for us, we'll both get in serious trouble. His panicked expression almost turns into a pleading one. I guess he was just pushing my buttons, but I can't help the fact he did get into my head. After the job! No, not now. I state sternly, trying to stabilise myself. This isn't the time to unleash my inner Dorothy. Yes, now. If you don't have some sense whipped into you by a very nasty wolf, just shut up and get a move on. He sneers, grabbing my hand harshly and pulling me into a forced march. His fluffy paws are warm, and for whatever reason it clutches my attention. A distraction perhaps from another approach and panic attack. Seriously, you're acting all over the place. Triss grumbles, still holding my hand firm and enforcing the tempo. Yes, mainly I'm not exactly here and now. Comes with the territory of waking up in the middle of fucking nowhere with no memories. As if. He scoffs and I have enough. I yank my hand free, stopping again in my tracks and giving him an angered look. The bunny is more than fed up with me, its expression making it clear, but then its extension shifts to my shoulders. You're shivering, they'll notice that. He states with concern, I notice I'm wobbling like a jello. I guess my resolve isn't as strong as I'd hoped. I can't help it. I mutter, rubbing my hands across the arms. You have to, they're all wolves there. I'm a damned rabbit and even I can sense your fear. You're the one who keeps freaking me out. For a spy, your nerves are made of straw. I'm not a spy. I shout out, my eyes getting glossed over. Fuck, I'm such a Dorothy. Or more like a cowardly lion. Dorothy seems to keep her shit together slightly better than I do, more things considered. Okay, okay. Triss rushes to my side, shushing me. Just get your mind off of it. Try to relax. I can't. You have to. If I bring you in this state, they'll cause them to sniff. I'm sorry, but you seem to crack easier than brushwood. Just relax. His tone is now really desperate as he places his paw on my chest and tries to calm me down. How? Just ask me things. You seem to be an inquisitive sort. He struggles to come up with a distraction. 
You must have some questions. You hardly should have if someone wants to keep their speech a secret. He tries to make me laugh and I involuntarily chuckle. Eglipoi keeps hold of me and notices the silly barcode pattern. What's up with that tattoo? This? Never you mind. I narrow my brows. So much for asking you things. I mutter and the shivers rock me ever so slightly, causing the rabbit to reconsider. He squeezes my shoulder to steady me and releases a long sigh. It's a map of my burrow to remind me where I'm from. Did That's all you get on the matter. He interrupts me sternly. We aren't buddy enough, so don't ask me personal things. Despite his tone, he keeps holding on to me. This little gesture allowed me to slow down the torrent in my head and my emotions finally returned back into my control. Well, I was meaning to ask you something else. There was a book I read. Oh, a well-read human. Imagine that. He chuckles, tugging at my hand and trying to nudge me into a slow pace. Anyway, talked about the Tiger Rebellion. Mentioned how the Sylvan folk were instrumental in defeating the lions. I couldn't find any mention of the wolves. Why would you? Huh? I blink in confusion. Why do you find any specific mention of them? You mean the wolves came here after the rebellion? This time he's the one who stops and looks at me with serious disbelief. What is this? Are you for real? I know you think I'm a spy, but can you just entertain my memory loss for a little bit? Especially when it doesn't threaten your safety. Or are you telling me your life somehow hinges on my access to ancient history? Ah, fine. He concedes with an amused scoff and we continue to walk. I don't think you could possibly gain from feigning such ignorance, though so I suppose you were just badly educated. Yes, failed insults aside, can you elaborate? Why were wolves mentioned in the Tiger Rebellion, but Sylvan folk were? Because wolves are Sylvan folk. Oh, well, they used to be. What? I thought you're the Sylvan folk, you know, bunnies. I'm not a bunny. He looks at me sternly. Sylvan folk are all sort of kin who follow the path of Sylvan. Wolfkin, deerkin, bearkin, all bound together for the common good. Then why are wolves no longer part of that? Because wolves are exactly that, wolves. Once we managed to chase off the lions and regain our freedom, wolves who for centuries were the shield protecting the Sylvan turned against it. I guess they just realised they don't have to be equals anymore, but rather take that one step to elevate themselves above all others. I frown, not really sure which side of the story to trust anymore. I find it hard to believe it was that simple. I don't care what you believe. The facts speak for themselves. The lions got the boot and the wolves took their place. I thought the tigers did. The Tigeriae took the heart of Avalon for themselves. Staking claim to the most lush and fertile land on the continent, they didn't give two shits about some woodlands in the peripheries of their territory. Hmm. I ponder trying to digest the information. In all fairness, I'm getting more and more conflicting reports. The book made lions be the villains, with Targaryen and Sylvan folk parades of the true champions of justice and equality, while Rannoch sees all of it as bogus. Now, Triss says it's the wolves who are the bad guys. I mean, they do seem a bit unhinged at times and slightly on the extreme side of things, but... This whole thing is so confusing. Rannoch seems to dislike the tigers, and matter gauging the rabbit's opinion. He believes the rebellion was a lie, that the tigers were the ones who replaced the Lion King. Tigers allowed other races to self-determine their future. That's more than can be said about the wolves. They simply determined that Tiernan is theirs and no one else's. Hmm. I frown he's clearly biased and Triss quickly notices my doubt. I mean, look at you. It didn't take long for Rannoch to place that collar on you. One way or another, wolves always mark their territory. For all the bluster about making a change, Rannock never really considered the foundations upon which his entire worldview was built. He wants to repaint the cracks in the wall, while the only just thing to do is tear the whole damn thing down. He concludes his passionate speech, but I'm unconvinced. Yes, Rannock does seem to be confused and wrapped up in the delicate balance between change and traditions, but his heart seems to be in the good place most of the time. Is that why you give him the stink eye while in his service? Because he's not as radical a revolutionary as you'd like him to be. He's a wolf. He might seem nice as the pack, but he's still one of them. I stop, looking at him with a rather disappointed expression. That's a bit racist. 
A wolf will always remain a wolf. They only look out for each other. He simply shrugs it off and continues walking on. I guess he's not going to deny it. I try to make up the distance, for as much as the conversation became uncomfortable, I cannot just drop it. He's got Ranak all wrong. I was lost and injured. He saved my life. Ranak doesn't care about you or your life. Neither does any other wolf for that matter. I don't know what sorcery used to avoid getting killed on sight. I know it ain't natural. Well, you're wrong. Am I? He pushes his finger into my chest once again, stopping us in our track. How long have you been here? A week? Two? I lived with Ranok for nearly a year. I'd say I'm a far better judge of his character than you are. Did he mistreat you? I asked plainly, fed up with his weird beef against the wolf. What? Did he mistreat you? I reiterate and he just stares at me blankly. Define mistreat. Seriously? I scoff. What's your point, human? If you're saying those wolves are bad, I just want to know what that means for me. For one attendant to another. <sighs> he storms off from me, clearly annoyed with my line of thinking. It only proves me he doesn't have any actual dirt on Ranok. I cannot believe my wolf would do anything to harm him. I simply follow behind the bunny, determined to have him vocalise what I already know. It's a simple question, Trist. Did Ranok mistreat you? No, he didn't mistreat me. Did he order you around? Demand anything of you? I continue getting exasperated by his bluster, which comes from a so far unfounded dislike towards an entire race. No. So he wasn't lying when he said you were able to simply mooch off him while doing fuck all in return. Mooch off? He stops again, rushing towards me and squaring off angrily. I see his paws closing to tight fists and half expect a sucker punch, but it never comes. Listen here, you glorified, fancy-looking fuck toy. I never asked to be here. He sneers angrily and about to retort to his insult when he spits his words at me like bullets in quick succession. My burrow suffered two harsh winters in a row. I saw my friends and siblings succumb to starvation while we had to ship off what little food we had left to those damn wolves as tribute. You see them feasting and dancing every night, gorging themselves on ridiculous amounts of food. Our food! You find it charming. I saw you joining the funds if you were one of them. Well, know this. All that moment happens on the back-breaking lay of my kin. I just stare at him, his tiny rattled chest raising and falling in quick succession. I... I didn't know. I blurt out remorsefully. For the right to live in our groves, the wolves demand tribute, and that tribute has to be paid no matter the cost. Finally, when we had nothing to spare and the tribute ended, we had to surrender our firstborns. That's how I got this. He points to his collar and I instinctively touch my very own. The last time I saw my mother was when she was huddled in the dirt. She was screaming my name as I was dragged away by those brutes to pay off a debt my burrow incurred for the insult of running out of food. So yes, I don't consider Rannoch's lax attitude a saving grace. I don't acknowledge any of these wolves or anything more than what they actually are, savage monsters who will murder us with a bat in life if we step out of line. So you better wake up and smell the roses. I can see his nose twitch as he takes an idle sniff. Or lavender in your case, you even smell like a whore. I'm stunned, standing in complete shock and utter disbelief. If what he says is true, the wolves committed an unforgivable extortion. It makes his behaviour so much more justifiable. But even if it is true, if the wolves are a whole like this, then... They're all the same! No, no. Rannoch's different. I mutter, the panic quickly returning. Shh, naive and stubborn. The bunny shrugs. Do as you wish, but you're fooling yourself thinking any of them your friend. I would feel pity for you had I not disliked you so much. I just stand there, helplessly confused. As he walks a fair distance from me, he finally stops, giving me an annoyed stare. You know what? Do whatever the fuck you like. I'm just going to tell them you ran away. It should make for a funny evening for the packs. They always enjoy a good sport. No. I shake my head, finally shaking my stupor and approaching him. Oh, so you're coming then? Good. But don't you dare question my situation again or I will get you killed one way or the other. I don't respond, not because I particularly believe his threat, because I can see that the bunny is very much speaking out of anger. Not that I blame him. Knowing the context of his wardship does explain a lot. 
At the same time, it's clear he's not giving anyone a chance. Not to Ranlock, not even to me. If anything, he simply perpetuates his loneliness and bitterness through choice. Our circumstances are very much the same in one single aspect. We both have no way out other than to follow the lead. What we can choose, though, is to make the best of a bad situation. Triss just decides to make a bad situation worse. You know, you're the first person I actually get to talk to outside of that damned house. Despite you doing your darndest to spoil this for me, I still am going to enjoy it for its worth. Then enjoy it in silence. He sneers angrily and I simply shrug. I guess our relationship will continue to be shaky. I understand some of his points, but he cannot be writing off an entire people that easily. For all being a prime example, first I hated the black male with all my heart, his fear incarnate, especially after he choked me out. The first time, the second wasn't as terrifying, just disappointing. I resonantly rubbed my throat, again reminded I'm wearing a collar like a pet. Although Triss tried to ruin it for me, I still prefer to think of it as a memento. However, my personal attachments don't justify the shit those wolves are doing. Things are much darker around here than I originally thought. But, for all proof best, you cannot judge a book by its cover, no matter how feral and barbaric it might seem at first. I'm sure that for any questionable aspect of their way of life, there's another awe-inspiring one. Just like the name trees. Experiencing that living cemetery in person left a lasting impression, as many other things will in time. We continue walking in silence, with Trist's expression softening as the time passes by. The villa seems to be quite some distance from the village. Roughly half an hour into our trek, I hear the bunny exhale heavily and give me a more toned look. Nearly there. I can see he cooled off and decided to seize the opportunity to bury the proverbial hatchet. Okay, we clearly got off on the wrong foot. No shit. We can fight and squabble all we like for the moment we're in this together. Since we're about to enter the wolf den, I suggest we make a temporary truce. I don't trust your naive shtick one bit. You're either dumb or a spy. I still haven't decided which. It either makes a convincing argument for any sort of dealings with the likes of you. He tries to sound nasty, but I shrug, not even acknowledging his jabs. As the silence protracts, he first dons a scowl on the count of my lack of reaction, then his expression softens and he sighs in defeat. I guess rational thinking takes this guy a while. Ah, you're right. If you fuck up, chance of me getting out and scathe the low. Especially with the three alphas involved, you seem to be close with them. I don't suppose Ranak will easily forgive if anything happened to his new perfume toy under my care? He says the last words with clear displeasure. I suppose for a day we can have a truce. This seems very disingenuous, as much as I want to tell him to shove such a truce beneath his tail, I really have no idea what I'm in for. Fuck. I curse under my breath. This won't be an easy alliance. Okay, could you stop being such a dick all the time? Fine, as long as you stop talking out of your ass. My eyes widen in shock, and I want to start another argument, but I realise it won't get us anywhere. I release an exasperated sigh and simply extend my hand towards him. Fine. He looks at me with slight surprise if he didn't know what I'd meant. Your people don't shake on deals? I shake? I just grab his paw and show him how it's done. He seems confused at the meaning of the gesture, carefully inspecting his paw once it is free as if to see I haven't done anything to it. Huh. I'll try to follow your lead, but if I sense a trap... This entire setup is a trap. The bunny grumbles, shaking off his paws he wanted to be rid of my cooties. Elders were furious at Rissa's little stunt. They boycotted the feast ever since your presence was discovered. They want their displeasure widely known. So that's why I haven't seen any old wolves there. Sending you to the village to that private meal is going to provoke a reaction. Though I am scared of the wolves, I'm hardly intimidated by some geriatric beastmen. What are they going to do, berate me? We'll be fine, just don't fuck me over. Right back at you, human. As we finish our little exchange, I notice a small opening in the canopy, which allows more of the light to flood into the woodland tunnel. There are two tall columns on the left side, flanking a pathway leading away from the Sylvan Road. Just as we take that turn, my eyes witness the most unexpected of sights. Holy crap! I gasp in astonishment as I finally get to see the villa. It completely throws me off, so I did not expect it to look this sophisticated. What's the matter? 
I'm not sure I was expecting, but this is something. Looks very Romanesque. Romanesque? You wouldn't understand. I chuckled, shaking my head. It's a remnant of the old kingdom, left to rot in these woods like a dozen other Leonine residences. This one doesn't look rotten. Rana's grandfather began restorative efforts. By the time your master was born, it was pretty much completely refurbished. I frowned until he calls Ranak my master. But I guess that's what he is in official capacity. Does this mean Ranak grew up here? Of course. I'm surprised the wolf chose to live in his cosy little cottage when he could have just stayed here. His father even invited him back when I was hiding in the chest. This place could easily pass off as a palace. As you walk down the courtyard, I look at how well kept the hedges are. It must take a lot of work to keep this place well maintained. I should know. I'm the one doing it now. Yeah, sorry about that. It is what it is. The rabbit shrugs as we pass next to a small fountain planted in the middle of the yard. There are the kitchens and the stores. Triss points to the right and then turns my attention towards the left side. That's where the wards live. Obviously you're staying with Ranok now, but should you need to find help, that's where they'll be. I nod, noticing a slight bitterness in his voice as he mentions my current accommodation. I want to apologise, but he suddenly stops as the nether bunny leaves through the large portcullis. Now is a good time for you to shut up. Hey, Trist, what took you so long? A slender female calls out. She carries a basket of lint towards the kitchens. A human is as dumb as a mule. What can you do? I dart my eyes to Trist in slight annoyance. Haha, <laughs> yeah, he looks kind of daffy, doesn't he? Yep. He laughs it off and waits for the female to go about her business. Was that necessary? I muttered through my clenched lips. Oh, poor kid, you need a thicker skin to serve here. I don't think I like that insinuation. Too bad, because those wolves don't care. Come on. He waves at me and we walk towards the doorway. As we pass beneath the portcullis, I notice an inscription. I can swear it's Latin. Virtute fulgida domus. Somehow I know what it means. In virtue, a house shines. I am waiting for a place Ranak grew up in. As we enter the villa, my eyes take a while to readjust the sparse light inside the enclosed corridor. I blink, trying to regain my vision, and immediately taken aback. Amazed at how perfectly the building blends simple, functional architecture with a few elaborate details to create a refined aesthetic. And the atrium stands as a testament to that. I'm most fond of the sizeable pool collecting the rainwater from the opening above. The recliners on each side seem quite comfy. This looks definitely Roman. I'm starting to get more and more confused about the whole deal with this place. I watch water lilies dance merrily on the mirror-like surface and smile. I hear la di da from wherever I get. Listen very carefully. I shall say this only once. When inside, you will be very much on your own, so tread carefully. Yet is in a worried whisper. You know the chief and Vither already. They have their taste, but the elders are a different matter entirely. They are not to be trifled with. Especially not Aldris. She's the mean fat one. Then there's your childhood friend Dran. Be careful around them. I nod. They're both cunts. Worse yet, they're very observant cunts. You can ignore Enel. She's a senile old she-wolf and spends most of the time either sleeping or daydreaming. Triss takes a deep breath, as if trying to muster his courage. Since you understand their language, try to ignore verbal cues. Only respond to gestures. I know, I've been discreet so far. He scoffs at me, giving me a patronising look. If you call that embarrassing display the feast discreet, then we're both fucked. Right, here goes nothing. Triss sighs and finally leads us into the next room. I nearly gasp, taking a step back to the side of what I assume is the Great Hall of the Chief. The space is grandiose, with three columns on each side propping up the elevated rooftop. I look around, taking the light cascading from up above and seeping in from a set of windows on the far side. I spot the thrones we approach the middle of the room, which features an open hearth surrounded by tables. The gather took notice of our arrival, five wolves in total. 
The chief sits comfortably in the central chair, leaning to his left side and clearly discussing something with Vitha who replenishes his drink. I haven't seen the other wolves before, not even at the feast. We've seen they're all enjoying an afternoon snack, aside from a solitary slender old female which is either dead or asleep. I'm guessing that's a Nell. Oh, finally, I thought the damn rabbit had bought it. Fetching out a wine grew tiresome. A stubby, nasty looking she wolf speaks in a rather unpleasant tone, drawing my attention to the right. Yeah, don't do that for me, an example of the last one. A rounded neighbour replied, they both laughed sardonically, causing my skin to crawl the remark. It would seem when the Sylvan Float tried to quit his place as ward. Yes, it doesn't work that way. Oh, so this is the human. <laughs> The female muses, straining her aunt's size eyes in my direction. Just the sight of that thing makes my bowels churn. I very much doubt you can see me, old bat. Why is it dressed like that? Is that a sapphire selling gold? I thought he was found naked. Well, if your bowels churn now, perhaps it's best he's dressed at all. Bitter laughs, allowing his voice to rumble across the hall. Oh, quite right. The female nods, picking through some niblets on one of the plates. Oh, it, what is this? She suddenly mutters, toying with something in her paw. Yo, you damn fool! She nearly howls at Trist. I told you to bring me dates! These are figs, you idiot! The old female throws a hard lump towards him, hitting the bunny on the chest. As the projectile plops to the floor, I look down at it. I might not know how a candied fig would look like... But that there's a date clear as day. That bitch needs some spectacles, pronto. And by the by, get her attitude checked. The bunny nods apologetically and rushes off behind one of the doors. I swear, if she throws anything at me, I'm going to secretly spit in her food. Yo, shorter sentences, please. The old male mutters, rubbing his temple. I cannot stand the sound of that language. It's like your tongue is swollen and you're choking on it. Ah, uh, not this again. I really need to be extra careful. I cannot distinguish their language hopping. In all honesty, it feels I have been pranked. Hey, you monkey, come here! She calls out to me. Come here! She reiterates I'm not speeding as of my reaction. I approach slowly, standing next to a chair. The old hag grabs my hands harshly, pulling closer almost causing me to trip. She twists my wrist to reveal the inside of my palms and leans in. For a second I think the female is about to lick them. Now I see she's squinting to better see. Um, good thing about this further species, it's quite easy to gauge who they actually are. She speaks, smacking her lips. Skin, you see, without fur, wears off easily. She finally shoves my hands away, forcing me to take a step back. This one hasn't worked a day in their life. Only true, wolves did take me through my paces, and I did clean Ronak's house, house twice over now. Uh, no, but then. Hmm. <laughs> Here we go again. And you say he doesn't speak neither Vanon nor Freya? Uh, no. Uh, curious. Triss gives me a worried glance as he returns her into the bowl. He bows respectfully as he presents it to the female. She plucks one of the dates and munches on it impatiently. Good, good, uh, much better. She weighs him dismissively when I regard the other plate on the table. It's the same fucking thing. As I roll my eyes, I feel a pour run through my lower back, causing me to jump up in shock. Her oh, dress is quite expensive, not to mention the belt. Hasn't it struck you as a bit insulting to have a slave walk around in such finery? Bingo, so the distinction isn't lost only on me, but on the wolves as well. Ward my ass. How did Ralk even afford this scandalous? I wouldn't know. As far as I remember, Ranok's pay remains untouched in the treasury. If you should look in on this, your boy seems to have sticky paws. Since when spending one's own coin amounts to stealing? Why did he waste such a fortune on? It wasn't Ranok. That dress was bought by Vulgar. A long gush of red wine sprays across the room as the old male chokes on his drink. He's coughing really bad, and I nearly allow a satisfied smirk to escape me. I pull off my stupor by the sound of the female snapping her fingers at Trist. You! Clean! She claps her paws, and an utterly contemptuous tone starts to irritate me. 
I watch with pity as Triss nods and rushes the side to fetch a water bucket and some cloth. You! Her annoying voice now in my direction. White! She points to the old male's chalice. White! She reiterates as I decide not to respond. I'm dumb after all, no? Bite the moot like wine, you pathetic wretch! She growls at me, mimicking a drinking motion. On the outside, I simply nod gracefully and walk towards the side cupboard to pick up a jug. But on the inside, I'm screaming. Triss points with his hand at the correct flag and I nod to him gratefully. I begin to really feel sorry for the bunny. I do hope this level of abuse is not his daily bread and butter. I approach the old male, waiting a moment to allow him to end his coffee fit as he struggles to keep his cup in level. Finally, I just refill it. That's when the female pushes her own cup in my direction. I have half a mind to spill the wine over her head, but I know better. Also, I wouldn't want to add to Triss's load, seeing as he frantically scrubs the floor. Once both their drinks are replenished, she waves me away and I step to the side. What is nonsense about vulgar by the dress for a human? The male finally wheezes out. He nearly drowned in that wine. Nearly. What a pity. I had out his intent of the humans. That was over five years ago. He asked me to help him shop in Strandbard. Why do you want to buy a dress? I don't know. Ithar shrugs indifferently on his snigger. Maybe he likes playing dress up at night. Yeah, the coin. The rest is no business of mine. The female growls softly, annoyed he dodged her question. And how did that expensive Targaryen dress end up on this human filth? Again, I don't know, nor do I care. He responds nonchalantly, or I can see a slight shift in his expression. Why don't you ask him yourselves? I'm sure Volko would love to indulge you. He proposes cheekily, and both elders simply cough it off in this typical geriatric way. I can have him stripped naked if that dress bothers you so. Oh, considering your gag reflex. The chief adds in a mocking way. I don't find the joke funny. Oh, yes, yes, Varrock, very droll. Uh, shall we then return to the matter at hand? When I wake her up, or is she finally dead? The old male points to the third elder seated on the other side of the room, and I wonder the same. She's such a frail, ancient-looking female. I didn't pay her any mind for the lack of movement. An L! He calls out. An L! An L! The hag next to him shouts out while throwing a candy date at a target. Oh, oh, what was that? Oh, what's happening? Finally, life turns into the old she-wolf. We're discussing Rannoch's scouting mission. Uh, Rannoch is Varrock's son, right? Or is it the other way around? The female asks, and I just open my eyes wide. Is this for real? What are you talking about? How could it be the other way around? I'm sorry, I'm only half paying attention. How many have been attention for the past 20 years? There's some wine, that should clear up her head. He points at me, although initially I want to react. I remember I need to double down on my dumb act, so I just stand still. You, wine! The male nearly growls, and that's when Triss gets up from the floor, dropping the wine stained rag back into the bucket. He approaches me and takes the jug from my hand. The bunny walks towards Anel to fill a cup, while the two nasty elders glare at me intensively. What's the point of that idiot? What possible use could he be to Rannoch? My son seems satisfied with his service. He says he's a good attendant. The chief shrugs, taking a sip of his wine. Attendant? The hag scoffs. He's more like a pillar. Our well, fellows are at least nice to look at. Ugly damn thing ruins my appetite. Triss gives me an empathetic look as he passes by to return the jug to the cupboard. Oh, this wine is absolutely lovely. What year is it? Uh, last year, love. It's a young cask of my own reserves. Mm, it does hit the spot, doesn't it, Varys? She smiles at the pudgy female and her eyes open wide in annoyance. I'm Aldris! Oh, so you are. And now gives her another kind smile. I say her, she's always bringing up my bloody sister. It's like she's trying to wind me up. I struggle and take a chuckle, seeing the hag so easily upset. 
I come to starve you at this pace. Ritha grumbles and waves his paw gently at the bunny. A tryst uh, chickens. His voice, although loud, carries a rather polite tone. The bunny nods and bids me to follow him into the side room. The shelves are stocked high with different jars and containers. At a quick glance, it's obvious the chamber serves the role of a pantry. Two tables at the side are stocked high with different dishes, called meats, fruits, veg and raw poultry. It's not cooked, I whisper, poking at the squishy chicken breast. Yeah, we need to do it on the spit. Can you fetch it? The one from the main hall. The bunny nods and I shrug, returning back to the small, sprawling room. I'm back to the point at hand. What are we going to do about patrols? Well, I can't send packs blind into the woods where we don't even know what's happening at the border. I walk slowly towards the open hearth, trying not to draw too much attention to myself. I say we need to call in the outer alphas. Isn't that a bit drastic? No, drastic. We lost two packs in the northern reaches. I retrieve a long prong, careful not to burn myself with it. We haven't lost them. We know where they are. We just lost contact, which is a whole deal different. The subject of the conversation catches my attention, and trying to be as tardy as possible while still remaining inconspicuous. We told you to wait another week for starting a panic, and yet you ignored us and sent Rannock on a rescue mission. I didn't send him. I actually advised against it. He volunteered anyway out of duty. I can't stop an alpha from trying to locate his missing tribes wolves now, can we? It's his departure, the entire village is talking about them as if they were dead. Yeah, I witnessed that myself. What if they are? The worst comes to the past. Having outer alphas mobilized to the right course of action. This is exactly the type of hysteria that leads to disaster. Young hotbirds are brute in civil governance through brute force. Are you suggesting I'm planning a coup? I stop in my tracks and gaze towards the chief, whose expression betrays he very much is losing his composure. Whether you plan one or not is beside the point. Warriors gathered in one place and left idle invariably lead to unrest. Psst, what are you doing? Triss waves at me from the pantry and I pull myself out of my days. We will deal with this and we always have, with patience and clear mind. As I enter the room, I close up the doors, but not quite, still very much intent on eavesdropping. Rock should be back in a few days, so the packs perish and be able to mobilise the entire tribe. Until then, we just wait. What's going on? They talk about Rannoch's scouting mission and some political stuff. I mutter, passing him the spit and listening on. Either way, don't vote against any designs on Tienan. He's preparing for another raid, most likely. It's more like the more you're using the state put. Besides to target the tag area, the last thing you want is to have an army amassed in your village. I heard the word tag area. Please tell me those idiots aren't planning another war. The bunny whispers, while impaling the chickens onto the prong one by one. It will make us look like a complicit. You of all wolves should know the tigers who don't distinguish easily between us. I was a pup then. I've seen what they're capable of. You don't want to invoke the wrath of Tageron. Well, especially on account of someone else's foolish endeavour. I... I don't think so. I reply uncertainly, getting lost in the conversation. I suppose for a moment it's not a raid, though. I suppose Vortigern very much is eyeing out other tribes. They seem to be worried about someone called Vortigern. Do you know who that is? Oh, and who he is, is an ambitious wolven chief from the north and very bad news for everyone. If they're actually worried about him, things are worse than I thought. But this changes everything. The bunny ponders, its expression beaming with determination. What does? You're understanding them. Look, I know we got off on the wrong foot, but my people are always the ones who play the price in any conflict. His voice is almost pleading. If you hear anything indicating my people might be in danger, you must tell me. Of course. I nod. This was never in question. Triss simply smiles and passes me the spit. It's quite heavy now that the three chickens weigh it down. Go in there and rotate it slowly. It'll give you an excuse to listen on. I nod and do exactly as I'm told. Well, if that's the case, it was only a matter of time. After was it, 30 years since the last tribal war? I should know. With the grumbles and annoyance poking at one of his scars. Would have been just twenty had your father had his way. The female waves of the chiefs had carefully installed the prong back into the hearth, being slowly turning the handle. So this is your counsel, do nothing. Last well, time we took drastic action, we all played the price. Perhaps now you'll listen to elders. Caution isn't the same as inaction. 
when facing a threat of war, sometimes the best response is not to draw your sword, but rather reach for the quill. I notice the chief and Vitharis exchanges gasperated gazes. So you are the peacekeepers now? His tone is so cynical it makes even me doubt their true motives. Yes, we are. And if you can't be so interested in peace, I don't understand your tardiness. When is Mage going to arrive? Both wolves are of age now. We should move as fast as possible. Huh? Which wolves? I quite agree. This alliance was decades in the making. We can't let current circumstances sow any doubt in Air Kane's mind. His first one is a prize in her own right. You're willing to let her slip through your fingers? She should be here around the Equinox. The chief waves him dismissively. Is that late? Why not now? Well, that more would have been an auspicious sign to seal the deal. And perhaps even make them truly bond. I have a nagging feeling of discussing Ranok as intended. I feel as if a rock formed inside of my stomach. Oh, I dozed off again. What did I miss? The ancient female stirs up. I almost forgot she's even there. Are we talking about Maeve? Oh, good. good. Uh, some porridge or pudding, perhaps? I was getting quite peckish. Maeve, not Maeve. What is the matter with you? Oh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought it was a working luncheon. You're becoming quite annoying. The old male snarls. I try my hardest to look completely clueless, but it's becoming quite a challenge. Russian and Smatra look at make us look desperate. I don't want the other tribes to think we're weak. Especially now, having the human here made us look like fools to begin with. With the draws their attention to me, and again the old wolves give me nasty gazes. Just smile and turn, smile and turn, round and round the spit goes. Which reminds me, how did you manage to get past our patrols? Did you punish anyone? Like who? We don't even know which of the sentries failed. If the human is here, then they all fail. Just selected any wolf and simply make an example out of him. You're going to kill that mongrel as well. Damn, Tris wasn't kidding. Those two are absolutely horrible. In my time. Your time never came, old shield, so you're barking at the wrong tree. Don't we really have to have this talk during a meal? All those calls for blood make me lose my appetite. A discreet smile escapes me. Mithra is such a good wolf. I guess the Targaryen I really did rub off on him. This is not a silly matter, pup. And you're okay, in case your eyes went along with your senile mind. I am no pup. I haven't been called on in quite some time. Impertinent. Please, give at least some level of decorum. The other can are watching. The chief growls, pointing to me and Trist, who's now arranging small plates with cold meats around the table. I ask him to turn around and face the walls. Now, really? The male scoffs, clearly finding the comment distasteful. How have they been here this whole time? And now points was, darting her very confused eyes between me and the bunny. I guess the others did not deign to entertain a question. In any case, if Air Kane changes their mind, Rana can have Michael. The two of them are getting along quite well. I was right then, Maeve is Rannock's intended. And don't be obscene, your relationship with the Chief is incestuous as it is. Vitha coughs up his wise, he's just about to take a sip. Oh yes, Vitha, don't be incestuous. The chief elbows his friend teasingly, but it seems only to aggravate the elders even more. If you lose that match, you'll lose the alliance that comes with it. I was talking about losing it. I'm just saying the boy won't have to go without a mate for long should the worst come to pass. The females are practically queuing up for the fucker. Mitha raises his cup towards the chief, and the male laughs back at him with clear pride in his voice. You already think we don't see your little game? That we'd allow you two to accumulate enough power to stack this head on? You defective whelp! I could tackle you right here, right now, old man. The brown wolf stands up, and it's the first time I see his muzzle show very little cheer or levity. You're going to allow him to disrespect us like that? Oh, since my memory doesn't fail me, I can recall who was first to throw insults. The chief speaks slowly, making sure they understand the gravity of the situation. I'm going to brush it off to a heated exchange, unless you want to stand by your baseless accusations. It would be a shame having the end of the day with a duel for Vitha's satisfaction. The first time I notice Aldrich's eyes filled with something other than spite. She darts her worried gaze between determined muzzles of both queries and pats her friend on the shoulder. He did exchange nothing else. 
All right, Dran? Oh, heated, indeed. The old geezer concedes reluctantly. Would he really be so petty to throw his life away if she not intervened? Vitha would make mince meat out of him. And you have lots to learn. The hag throws a nasty gaze towards the brown wolf. The mockery and contemptuous attitude you display is unbecoming of your position. The title of Varrock's advisor should have gone to a true wolf of merit, not a simple-minded brute. A brute? Vitha is the sweetest wolf I've met so far. No, not Captain Ranlock, of course. As a top offer of my generation, she-wolf, every scar on my body is a badge of merit. He points to his many wounds as he takes his seat, Mac. What were you, a dead mother and your friend of their glorified quill pusher? Don't you talk to me about merit. Preposterous. And Nell, get away in. Why are, you dra- why are you dragging her into this? Is it because she's accomplished more in a lifetime than the two of you combined? How dare you! Now it's the old timer who raises it from his seat. And Nell! Oh, I'm sorry, I'm miles away. I was thinking it'd be such joy to have some nice fruit punch. It has gotten tremendously hot in here. She finds a poor her face as she gazes towards the fire. At first they're both stumped. The old male quickly exhales heavily and throws his angered stare at us. Yo, buddy, teach pig how serve. He growls nastily, redirecting all his anger at me. What a coward, picking on the easiest prey. I follow Tristan to the pantry, seeing the bunny nearly seething. Yeah, not only they butcher our kin, they also butcher our language. As we enter the chamber, I watch the bunny scatter about, bringing all different ingredients together. The whole conversation got me extremely worried. You're not kidding, those two are horrible cunts. The bunny chuckles, looking at me with the first genuinely friendly expression. They are cunts, aren't they? He laughs it off as he grabs a large picture and fills it up with some dried fruit. Fetch that flagon, there should be some merry wine left. I nod and uncork the bottle. Take a quick sniff and savour the lovely sweet aroma. Ronald told me the meat in save my life took day and night on their account. And much as Tris pours the wine into the pitcher. Do you me insane having listened to those two? I should know, I've been there. It almost descended into a fist fight several times. I frown, passing him different containers he points to. Be happy, it's just the two of them. There's more elders? Of course. He scoffs at my, in retrospect, silly question. Most of them live remotely, though, spread across the territory. It's just a handful that lives near the village. And among them, these two. I wince uncomfortably. Yeah. I have to concede, Aldris and Dran are the worst of the bunch. They are. Rither seems such a good wolf. It amazes me they're acting on like this. Oh, they respect no one. I'm out of my memories, but I'm sure they'd be on top of the pe- list of nastiest people I've ever met. From the way the bunny prepares the punch, it very much looks like sangria, just with dried fruit and spices. He adds some lemongrass and mint as well. In truth, this does seem like a nice drink. I need to quickly check on the chickens before they burn. All I need to do is simply add a splash of moonshine and stir it in. Okay. I nods, he passes me a small jar filled with a familiar clear liquid. He then hastily rushes to the main hall. I watch the dwarves curious as I hear the elders immediately abuse the crap out of the bunny as he enters the light of sight. Where's that damn punch, you lazy bastard? Oh, if it's my turn, I'd have whipped some life into his step. Remark causes my hands to tremble as I open the jar I accidentally drop it whole into the pitcher. Shit. I gasp, almost dipping my fingers into the mixture and delayed reflex. But it's too late, the jar already plummeted to the bottom. Just as on cue, Trist rushes back and yanks the jug from me. No, wait. I try to stop him, but cover my mouth, hoping to God I wasn't heard. Fuck. And Torn being just hiding or rushing after him. I cannot leave the bunny to face the abuse alone. I simply walk out of the lively gate, trying to catch up to him, but I'm too late. Trist pours a nail a large serving, and the female wets her lips only to jolt up in surprise. Ooh! She gasps with her eyes wide open. Oh, this punch is really fucking strong. I'm sure my face is white like a sheet of paper while Tris gives me a what the hell look. What did you do, you damn savages? Oh no, no, I quite like it. Oh, it puts life back into my veins. The ancient she-wolf smiles and musters another sip. 
I'm not sure if she's actually enjoyed it or not, but she puts on a brave smile. Seriously, she should have gotten rid of Trist a long time ago. That kid has an attitude problem. Oh, Trist the bunny, right? Or is, is it the other one? How could it be the other one? Can you actually see him? Well, he looks a little underfed. Is he one of yours? A question causes the two to exchange stump looks. So obviously she's trying to derail them to prevent further abuse. I only remember the meeting from a few days ago. Rannock brought a human into the village. A human? Here? Yeah. Oh, don't, don't be silly. Are you quite sure it's not just a bunny with some horrible skin condition? She scoffs and takes another shallow sip of our overproof punch. A bunny? He's a bloody standing right there, human in the flesh! Oh, so he is. But who would do such a thing? Rannoch! Rannoch did it! Darling, just let it go. And this body's like talking to a potted plant. I'm looking at Anal's peaceful yet sunny expression and can't help but feel she's simply messing with them. Once Triss pl placed the punch on the side cupboard, it returns to my side, observing the rotating chickens. Not that this little exchange wasn't amusing, but we need to return to the main business. Whether you like it or not, we need to send word to our packs. Being cautious is one thing, being caught unawares is another. Agreed. I'd rather have all the Alphas mobilised and ready should the situation in the North threaten our way of life. You're all trying on dangerous ground, Varrock. Have we told you our position on the matter? If you keep ignoring our counsel, we'll have to invoke a howl and put your position to serious deliberation. Good. Do so. The chief shrugs, catch them by surprise. If you do, Harry, you'll bring all the Alphas right here where I want them. I can see the two elders exchange aggravated looks as they realise he has cornered them. Uncomfortable silence falls over the room that looks to the bunny who disappears again into the pantry. He comes back with two small wooden boxes. They're beautifully decorated with floral and knot patterns, clearly holding something quite important. As he opens the lid on one of them, I immediately recognise the white salt crystals. I chuckle under my breath. I swear, if he calls me a lord one more time... Triss takes a pinch and carefully sprinkles it over the rotating poultry. You're strong and honest yet again. What else do I expect? Two brutes with a shred of sense between them. The old female finally breaks the silence. Considering both me and Vith are pledged for our tribe in a war of your making, I see it's more of an authority on the matter than you could ever be. A quell pushers, politicians and diplomats, eager to spill others' blood from the safety of their dens. If Ordogan decides to attack us, I want to be ready, not caught unawares like a stalk prey. I'm willing to concede that a full mobilisation might not be in our best interest, but sending a, mo a warning out to our wolves is not a provocation. The bunny unlocks the other box, revealing some dried herbal mix. Again, he dusts the chickens with the blend, and a smile of satisfaction at the immediate aroma enveloping the room. The smell is quite divine, with small drizzles of fat dropping onto the fire below and empowering the scent permeating the air. You always find an excuse to get your way! Or perhaps our unacceptable mission is part of your ploy to sideline us. We should have demanded your pup's head for this atrocity. The hag waves a grubby paw at me in dismissive manner while the chief tenses up. He throws her the most murderous stare I've ever witnessed, and my heartbeat instantly skyrockets. The male looks more feral than when he's ready to kill me, yet the old fools don't seem to pay him any mind. Only a Nell seems to regard me, her eyes locking with mine and her twitch as she picked up on my distress. Your father would never... Well, he isn't around now, is he? The male growls viciously, his wet lips trembling with anger, revealing grit and fangs between, beneath them. I notice Vitter place a paw on his friend's shoulder, trying to calm him down, and the chief brushes it away. When was the last time you visited his name for you to meditate? The last time I needed to piss outdoors. <laughs> How dare you! Audrey's psychic rises up and slams his paw to the table in a display of defiance. Who does he think he can intimidate here? Maybe me, but he'd have no chance with the chief or Vitha. So much posturing. I almost sigh, noticing Anal continue to give me discreet gazes in this rare moment for alertness. She looks back at the spectacle in front of her, simply closing her eyes in resignation. You are here to advise me in governance, not to poke your nose in my family's affairs. Last time you did so, I lost a loved one. I won't let you do this again! The male growls once more in clear threat. 
The ancestors. If you mention the ancestors one more time, I shall make you one of them. And if you ever threaten my family again, I will use your collective name freeze as kindling on our next feast. This escalated quickly. The two elders looked immediately stumped and quickly threw their gazes at the female on the other side of the room, clearly looking for support. But Nell is again back in a torpor, eyes closed and moving almost as if she returned to the land of the dead. You always were profane of seeing, Marok, and you choose your company well. She darts her squinty eyes towards Vither. Play your continued blind blasphemy does not anger the spirits. Now, with shelter is human, you will have a lot to answer for when you finally face their judgment. Again, failing memory seems to be a recurring motif here. Uh, not that you would notice. The brown male scoffed in a nasty tone. I guess both his and the chief's patience ran out. This Rissa made it clear this is the will of the ancestors. You have no legs to stand on. The others give me another round of their spiteful looks. Rissa is a young bitch barely past her first heat. She does not speak for the ancestors. I suppose you do. I think yourself witty. When truth you just reveal your ignorance. We knew half the ancestors you now worship. We shared this world with them. Yes, they just had the decency to leave it when their time came. I almost choke on that remark, trying to cough it off as my reaction to the smoke filling the room due to the fat dripping from the spit. A blood moon has anointed this champion, Varok. Do not think that a Luna forgives and forgets. You speak for her as well now? I suggest you keep away from my family. Varok broke the law. And I'll break your jaw if you threaten him again. He clangs his cup against a table, spilling half its contents, and I shudder. Ronald's position seems to be very much hanging on the thread, and I try not to tear up. It's far as the only thing that stands between my wolf and those bloodthirsty monsters. You must be joking. Do I look like a jester to you? I had hoped my father taught you all what happens to those who don't stay in line. I warn you, Varok, times have changed. You cannot threaten us all. You serve the tribe at our pleasure, and we can find another should a need arise. Chris notices my mortified expression pokes me subtly. He makes a drinking gesture and points to the chief. I take his cue to fetch a jug and give him a grateful smile. He just made an excuse for me to remove myself from sight. My distress must have been getting quite clear, and had anyone noticed, my ability to understand them would have become apparent. As I approach the cupboard, I realise how shaky my hands are. I need to stabilise myself. Just as I reach for the jug of wine to refill the chief's cup, I spot the picture of the overproof punch. I look back, ensuring that no one pays me any mind as the heated exchange continues. You can bark all you like, Aldris. Without the quorum, you cannot do a thing, and no one will support you at the moment. Especially not with two missing alphas. I pour myself a cup and thirstily down it, grimacing heavily. Fuck, now I wasn't joking. This punch is really fucking strong. Convenient. And how convenient is your son responsible for finding them? Wouldn't surprise me if he was gone for weeks. Perish the thought. Those last three days were a nightmare without my wolf to guide me. I sigh, straighten my dress and try to compose myself. I take the wine jug and slowly approach the chief. As I pass next to Vithra, he winks discreetly, almost as if trying to give me courage. The chief doesn't even regard me, simply pushing his cup in my direction. I look at his wine-stained paw and refill his drink. You can think what you like. He sighs in a resigned tone. I feel sorry for the man's little outburst when we met makes much more sense now. I thought Rannoch was overwhelmed. This wolf is literally grey in a way because of these nasty schemers. I have such a newfound respect for how ferociously he protects his son, even in the face of his potential errors. How long do you think you can maintain this charade? If I only had a charade to maintain, old fool. Oh, did someone say charades? Oh, we're playing games now, what fun! The two nasty elders exchange annoyed looks and simply sneer at the other female. You have been of immense help, now, as always. It is my pleasure. She smiles obliviously while the other two stand up. I rush behind them to return the jug to the table and rejoin Trist at the hearth. Aren't you going to eat? I'd rather share a meal with pigs than with you two. Well, that can be arranged. The chief scoffs while the old hag throws another day to her counterpart. And now, come on, we're leaving. Oh, so soon? But we only just got here. 
Oh, I wish you would just bloody die already. The old male mutters as he passes next to me. He gives me a very mean look and I fight the urge to just stick my tongue out at him. Seeing them leave, both the chief and Vithra exchange relieved looks and return to a casual conversation. I watch as the elderly female struggles to stand up, her arms shaking as they strain against her own weight. Her friends pay her no mind as she's effectively left behind. I come to her side, gently sliding my hand under her arm and aiding her to her legs. My, what a gallant little pup! She mutters, drawn approving gazes at the chief and his friend. Lend me your paw until the doors, won't you? She points to the exit and I nod. Her walk is quite uncertain. She takes her time between each step. Oh, it was nice meeting you, young man. Do you like playing games? She asks sidely if I don't respond. I used to love playing games when I was a little pup. My mother often took me to visit with my father in the neighbouring tribe. Oh, such fun we would have. He always came up with the silliest of larks. A genuine cheer brings a smile to my face. But only one has been my utmost favourite through the years, to spot a true wolf. She lifts her finger, popping it into the distance. You see, there are only two types of people in this world. Wolves in sheepskins, and sheep in woven coats. The female leans in, whispering to revealing a secret. The true wolf is no fool. He lies in wait, patiently gauging his prey, only to engage when it favours his pack. She straightens up again. And then you have the sheep, parading around full of bluster and hubris, flaunting their fake coats like shields. You and I know the truth. A piece of fur is no armour. It's only their bluster that fools the rest. But not the real wolves. Real wolves know they only have to lay in wait for the right time. My heart skips a beat as I begin to think she's not what she appears. Her ear twitches again and her eyes centre on me with a smile. It's good to see another wolf around. This village has become a pasture as of late. She sighs as we arrive at the door and I release her from the hold. She bows her head respectfully and I reciprocate the gesture. With the last of the elders gone, the remaining two wolves seem to regain some of their usual humour I associate them with. I take turns with Trist rotating the spit, trying to draw much attention to either of us. The chief simply vents off his steam and engages Vithra in mocking the two cunts that left. I quite understand them, really. I wish I could work off some steam myself. They did get under my skin. Especially with how fixed they seem, fixated they seemed on Rannoch. Once the chickens are done, Trist removes them from the spit and places on nice silver plates. He garnishes them with some of the garden roots and vegetables to make the dishes more presentable to the wolves. We place the platters around them, plenty of food for the two males, and then begin to idly pick at their meals. Oh, poor fellas, suffered hell of abuse. I don't think they could understand it, eh? Ugh, the fucking things are more trouble than they're worth. The chief sneers at us, but I don't mind. He's still seizing, and so would I if someone threatened my son like that. We simply take a step back to give him some space. Oh, come now, they're without fault, you know that. Ritha places his paw on his friend's shoulder near the male sighs in defeat. Oh, I know. But I cannot help blaming the humour of this perilous situation. The brown male tries to speak, but the chief raises his hand to cut him off. Even if he is without fault, he put Rannoch in grave danger. And Rannoch put him in such in turn. They're riding the same cart, friend. Well, I don't despise that whelp. The chief sighs and waves his paw at me. In fact, he seems a positive factor. Rannoch's changed since his arrival. Well, the decision to undertake the search took me by surprise. That's true wolf behaviour. I thought he'd always remain a pup. See? With a smiles. We have to see this through, no matter where the chips may fall. Besides, if not the human, Aldrich would find another reason to get on our case. We're in perfect mutual check thus far. This human introduces an element of chaos I do not like. We're dancing to their tune for twenty years, old friend. This might be an opportunity to take away their fiddles. Well, I hope so. Well, I do hope so. The chief nods and waves his paw invitingly in both me and Trist. We approach cautiously, Trist more so than I do as he clearly didn't understand where this conversation went. 
To his surprise, the chief passes to us when the plates were just arranged. Yeah, eat. He grumbles, nodding towards the far end of the table. We both bow respectfully and take the plate with us to the designated area. Trisk gives me looks of utter disbelief as we take our seats. With some distance between us, the wolves return to their idle banter, with her trying to cheer up his friend with some jokes and reminiscing. The chief seems to enjoy their conversation about their joint love interest from years past. Probably she had a pair of tits one could bury his muzzle in. To each their own. I notice the bunny's reluctance at eating the chicken. I wonder for a moment if he's not a vegetarian. But his hunger expression quickly dispels this notion. I think he's worried it's some kind of trick. I take the lead and simply cut off a strip from the breast and put it into my mouth. Mm -hmm. Immediately I'm hit with a delicious blend of roasted chicken, thyme and coriander. All that time turning the damn spit was worth it. Seeing my liberty in enjoying the meal and no foreign repercussions, the bunny finally joins me. Wish we could have engaged in a similar banter as our betters, however we have to be mute. The meal and the scenery is enough to entertain us for as long as it takes to clean the chicken to the very bone. Through all this time the chief and Vitha didn't even ask even once for our help, the brown male refilling their cups himself and fetching things from the cupboard on his own. In fact that's pretty much what he was doing from the very beginning. Seems we're here at the whims of those two old farts. When we're finished with our meal, the chief dismisses us and Triss leads me back into the pantry. I help out with bringing various plates back into the room and we save up the last in foods by either putting them back into their respective containers or leaving them on the plates for later consumption. Perishables are dumped into a barrel that serves as a disposal bin. Apparently they use it for composting later, which again shows that nothing's really wasted here. I immediately think of recycling. This is a very green society, which makes sense since they live in the forest. Once the tables are empty and wiped clean, the bunny sighs. This was quite a workout. Ah, good work. Good leave. The chief waves at us, now almost smirks in characteristic broken speech. By Trist's annoyance, I deduce he is again using old Sylvan. We simply bow respectfully and walk towards the entrance. Once we're in the atrium, Trist takes a seat on one of the couches. He reclines back, resting against the wall, and I look around as he pats a spot beside him. Are we allowed to? Only the chief leaves here, and he's busy right now. What if someone sees us? All the attendants are bunnies. None of my kin will send you out to be at my side. Besides, I have good ears. I'll hear anyone approaching. Huh. I smile, taking a seat and resting my back. Damn, this cushion feels good. My feet are killing me. I look at my abused legs. I really need some shoes. I'd say it's your heart that's going to be your end. Hmm? You were quite rattled in there. I guess I should be thankful I cannot understand them. Heh, <laughs> yeah. Did you learn anything, little spy? The bunny winks at me playfully and I grimace. More than I'd like. Seems Rannock pretty much has a target on his back. Yeah, they do seem to dislike him a whole lot. Maybe, but now it seems more serious. The chief was very riled up. I saw that. And the elders, ugh. I sigh, shivering slightly. They seem one step away from deposing the chief. Trist looks into the distance, clearly thinking over I've just said, and the short pause falls upon us. He seems uneasy, and I give him an encouraging gaze. Look, in all honesty, I didn't mean half the things I said about your master. If you can even call him that. I raise my brow in confusion. I know he doesn't see himself as such. He tried to be friendly with me. I just couldn't bring myself to give him a chance. But I do see he's different. They all are. Who? The young wolves. They're from a different stock. Even Varrock and Vitha are. The elders are the warmongering, bloodthirsty savages stuck in the past. The bunny almost sneers, his choppers on full display. Varrock put an end to raids and pillaging. In fact, as much as I hate to admit it, Tina began prospering under his rule. The forest didn't experience war a generation. Such lengthy peace in some much needed breathing space. He readjusts himself begrudging his own confession. Although still very much oppressive, Barak loosened the iron grip on the Sylvan folk. We're allowed to practice our faith again, and even some of the wolves return to the old ways. The elders resent that. I ponder his words for a moment. Seems like Ranok wants to continue the course taken by his father. He wants even more change. 
I guess that's enough for the elders to despise the mere idea of him. It's not just that. I don't understand much of going on here, but I gathered Rannoch has hampered one of their schemes. How? I don't know. Trish shrugged, slightly defeated. It happened before I arrived here. All I know is that it somehow involved that white wolf you danced with. You mean Tano? Yeah. Huh, the plot thickens. But Rannoch and Tano are very much at odds at least three years now. It's hard to imagine the two of them working together against the elders. Unless that's what they fell out over. I considered discussing this further, but again, I just met the bunny. I shouldn't divulge Rannoch's private matters to everyone. Especially since his life seems to be hanging in the balance, as the chief said himself, I could be the one to tip the scales. I feel extremely unsettled and my heart speeds up a little. What is it? I worry about Rannoch. I worry, I worry because I don't even know what dangers lurk out in those woods, but worse yet, even if he returns his life is still in peril. More the reason to keep your head down. He bops me with his shoulder. The only way you can help him is by not accidentally tripping him over. Easier said than done. Rannoch has many friends, and it's clear he has one in you as well. I try not to blush at his frankness. Just make sure he doesn't lose them. He'll need all the allies to weather the coming storm. Storm? Triss looks at the floor for a moment and sighs. There is a war brewing. The entire forest whispers about it. We don't know with whom and when, but it's coming. Why did you think I was so intent on figuring you out? He jumps off the couch. I just don't want my people to get caught in between again. If I learn anything that will be to your kin's detriment, I will tell you. I promise. I know. The bunny nods, giving me a genuine smile. I can smell deceit and danger, one of the perks of being a prey kin. You're too much all over the place to be a threat. I smile back and stand up, trying to extend my hand. This doesn't mean I trust you. He mutters reluctantly, eyeing me out. But I suppose we can have a truce for the time being. Triss sighs when we shake on it. I'll take over your stink eye any day. Is it that effective? The bunny chuckles and I join his mirth. You have no idea. Good to know. As we walk outside, Triss turns to face me with an inquisitive look. Are you okay to head back on your own? Hmm? Since it's my first short day in a while, I'd like to unwind with my friends. Oh, yes, yeah, of course. I nod eagerly. I'll be fine, the path is quite straightforward. Yeah. So is acting ignorant, yet you managed to mess that up. Ha ha. I smirk, shaking my head. Just don't stray off the path. These woods are easy to get lost in. I nod again and wave the bunny goodbye as he heads towards his dorm. My, what a day. The walk back is quite refreshing, gives me a chance to digest everything that happened today. The elders proved everything Rannoch said and more. I cannot stand the thought of those two nasty beasts. Enel, on the other hand, oh nice, she's an enigma. Considering my current situation, surprised they're not exactly welcome. I'm glad I was able to get to know the bunny a bit more, now I understand his motives at the very least. He simply is trying to survive while at the same time looking out for his people. I would do the exact same thing had our roles re re been reversed. I close my eyes, taking in the air and the sounds, trying to get rid of the negativity accumulated because of those two old farts. This fairy tale slowly takes on a dangerous turn. I get back to the village without any problems, my head is slightly clearer. The tribes wolves give me a few funny looks as I pass through the main square, but nothing more. I try to give a glance towards Wolf's shop, but we're still ignoring each other, I suppose. If Wolf wants to act like a pup, so be it. I sigh and walk down the path leading towards Rannoch's house. Oh, hey there, pet. I look at the brown female rushing out from Vitter's house to greet me. She's carrying a small wicker basket filled with some bread and pastries. We're we waiting for you. My father asked me to give you these upon your return. And of course, Verissa returns the basket. The girl exaggeratedly points to herself, the shop and the basket. I take them. She pushes it into my hands and I can't help but smile and bow graciously. Indeed, an apple didn't fall far from the tree. I'm glad to see you in good spirits. Going to the villa can be quite stressful, especially with those grouches around. I look at her wide-eyed and she mimics an old hunched person shouting into the distance. 
Oh, boy, you said it, sister. Oh, Drat, you don't understand me, do you, sweetie? She frowns. I just try to maintain my dumbfounded expression. Let's see. If you... The female gently touches my chest. You sad, scared? She pantomimes his expressions. I really struggle internally not to erupt in the laughter. Come here. Her two fingers stride the air and then she points at Vitha's shop. Okay. She asks hopefully and I just sigh, nodding in gratitude. Damn it, girl, I really want to not like you. You make it impossible. Oh, good. She smiles and plants a kiss on my cheek. I'm actually stunned, rubbing the spot where her nose has just touched me, trying to conceal a blush. See you later, Bet. She turns to her home, and I think it's better I get out of sight while I draw someone's ire. Home, sweet home. I mutter under my breath, really glad to see the cottage again. I jump over the uneven step and regard the porch. The night's a night while I enjoy myself out in the open, just taking in the beautiful scenery. After the week I had, I deserve a little vacation. Plus the smell of the woods outside reminds me so much of him. Uh, I miss Ranok so much. I prop the basket next to the door. As I pass the table, I gently touch the dandelion to steady my emotions. The trek out to the villa and back again really took the wind out of my lungs. I guess my stamina is lower than I thought. The early clean-up didn't help either. I take a cup and pour myself some water, drinking it up in one go. I decide to rest up a bit, so I walk to the bedroom and plop onto the bed. My legs are killing me and my eyelids feel extremely heavy. I simply need to close my eyes for just a moment. I don't sleep well. In fact, I'm having a bit of a nightmare. My torturous dreams finally forces me awake sometime well into the evening. As I open my eyes to see the cottage flooded with darkness, I take a relief sigh. I can't remember what I dreamt about. All I know, it had something to do with Ranok. At least no whispers were involved this time, so I can easily brush it off to my worrying. I get up and walk to the kitchen. There's still ashes from the morning, but I'm too lazy to get this sorted now. I simply stack new pieces of wood and start a fire. One strike, two strikes, and now the kindling is burning. I'm getting better at this. Within moments, the room floods with the warm hues, and I decide to light up the candles as well. I'm still tremendously tired, but I need a moment's respite from my uneasy sleep. I am worried I might have stank up the dress during my rest, but it's airy enough to prevent me from sweating. I really ought to be more careful with it. I won't be going to bed dressed up like that. It's disrespectful. My gaze ventures towards the window and I see the moon high up above the treetops. Such a lovely night. I remind myself of the promise I made this morning. Day or night, nothing stops me from enjoying the lovely views on the porch. I pet softly the dandelion as I rustle about the kitchen, gathering some nibbles to take out with me. I place two rolls, a sausage and some cheese onto a plate and fill a tank of ale. Unwinding like this was a dream come true ever since I realised this place had a porch. I creak the door open and step outside, immediately walking towards the table. My skin shivers slightly as I take a seat. The chair is quite cool, but it's a welcome sensation. I just admire the scenery and wet my lips, noticing a faint glow of a fireplace in the distance. Ranok say that's where the sentries camp sometimes. I flash my brows and simply return to the unwinding, stargazing and breathing the windful scent of the forest. It's almost as if he's here with me. I wish we could share a drink. I raise my mugs towards the moon, knowing the very same ardent sphere is watching over my mool all forever he is. Your health, Wolf. Stay safe. I'm out here maybe half an hour to an hour, just trying to clear my mind and get ready for sleep proper, when I suddenly feel something strange. It's almost as if I'm being watched, and for the first time I feel uneasy here. I raise up, looking around the nearby bushes, but I can't notice anything. The incredibly disturbing feeling persists, and becoming more and more alarmed. It's like my prey mentality triggered for no reason, which makes me think there must be a reason. I throw my gaze towards the freight campfire in the distance. It's maybe 100, 200 metres away? I think I should alert someone. I get up to my feet and walk towards the stairs, instinctively jumping over the uneven stone. As I'm on the path, I take clear direction of the campfire and head for the determined gate. I manage 10, 20 paces perhaps, when two familiar wolves step out of the shadows to intercept me. Tyrant, don't! 
The guards had tackled Rannoch the day I was discovered. Hey, hey, you! Stop! What are you doing? The warrior stood guard over me and tries to restrain his friend, but he's not budging. Instead, the wolf approached me and barely contained snarl, and I wonder what his intentions are. Told you I should keep an eye on him. Oh, so they caused my weird unease. I almost wanted to laugh it off, so I was actually going to fetch them on their own account. You can't just go wandering around the village. Well, he does have Ron's crest on the collar. He's no ordinary slave. And another wolf that co- calls a rose by its name. As an attendant, he's suspected to run errands. In the middle of the night, Rannoch's not even here. Look, I'm seriously done fucking with Rannoch on his bullshit. He finally snaps, pushing the wolf away from me. My father is still pissy after he raided his house, and a dislocated shoulder is high enough price to pay for tacting him. I'm not fucking around with his pet as well. He points at me, and again I feel a bit sad that he got roughed up. The other wolf gives me a look of a, a contempt. He can barely keep his fangs from showing. Well, it's just all right having this creep. What are you two doing? Wolf's voice reaches her from behind. We all win, surprised by his sudden reappearance. Oh, well, God, we just noticed this one sneaking out. Oh, sneaking out? The black male raises his brow, stopping right beside me. Was he also watching me? I mean, I think those those damn woods are centred on this cottage. I know, I haven't noticed anything. It's all his idea. Dre offers a hasty excuse, pointing to his defiant companion. Oh, is that so? I, I mean, you know, he shouldn't... Why would we... Tyron stutters and finally cuts himself off, seeing his wolf's brow raises higher and higher. Damn, the black wolf sure knows how to intimidate everyone into submission. I didn't rest his pig lovers under house arrest. You two now charged with guarding Rannoch's property? No. Oh. Wolf feigned surprise. So, your duty tonight wasn't to harass his livestock? I know. What is your duty, then? Uh, sentry duty, just as I was about to remind this idiot. Again, Dreyer tries to pull his friend away, finally managing to budge the wolf from his spot. Well, if you're on my pack, and I'd find your way from your post. Uh, forgive us, it won't happen again. With his son bows respectfully, cutting the black male off. Make sure it won't. Now fuck off, scrubs. Both wolves bow deeply and hastily retreat towards their campfire. I cannot contain a smile that complete show of deference and submission, which is quickly wiped away by Vol's scornful look. What are you doing, piglet? You're mistaken this for some sort of getaway. You're in danger. Do not go outside at night. He states sternly, I point towards the cottage. I was just sitting out on the porch. Something made me feel uneasy as if I'd been watched. I wanted to fetch the sentries. Turns out they're the ones stalking me. The black male scoffs and proceeds to walk towards the house. As I come to his side, I cannot fight the urge to call him out as well. They weren't the only ones stalking me, though, were they? Hmm. He frowns, but surprisingly he doesn't take it badly. I was only looking out for you. I know you're an impulsive little piggy. Takes one to no one. He stops looking back at me with a shocked gaze, but quickly turns away. His expression changes, however it's something quite different than one expected. He's hurt, and instead of his normal lashing out, he simply storms off towards the village. Oh, wait. I try to catch up, but he's not slowing down. Please, can we just talk about this? Well, there's nothing to talk about. I grab his paw and try tugging at it, if he's having none of it. Then the paw takes a long swing, ready to send me into the dirt, and I close my eyes. As I expect the hit, his paw stops just inches away from me. He stands there, rattled and looking back at me with disbelief. Well... I flee calmly and his shock only grows. He's stunned that I'm not afraid and do not flinch. As far as I'm concerned, you haven't broken your word. You haven't hurt me. Because I chose not to be hurt. You promised Rannoch you'll take care of me. That's a word I cannot keep on your behalf. His brows curve upward in a sorrowful expression. And I can see I hit the nail. I don't want this poison to fester between us. We might not be friends, but I know this will eat at you and affect your relationship with him. With her. You're an honest wolf. Try and be an adult one, too. Then it happens. Something I never expected to see. Fool's lips curl up in a snarl, but it's not directed at me. I can see the anger brewing inside of him as his eyes well up. He's furious with himself, unable to process the emotions that he kept bottling up for so long. 
Got a whole cask of beer in there. And knowing now there's a porch, you don't have to worry about looking defective by stepping inside the house at night. I tried to ease the mood by introducing some levity, and surprisingly it works. He scoffs at me in amusement, somehow managing to suck up the unspent tears. He's so much of a wolf to shed even a single one. Come. I bid him to follow and we walk towards the house. If you don't have to talk if you don't want to. Just enjoying beer in each other's company will do. I rush into the kitchen, grabbing a spare chair and dragging it outside. Placing it on the other side of the table, inviting the male to take a seat. As he makes himself comfortable, I run back inside to fetch him a mug of ale. I dip the tankard into the barrel and carefully bring it outside. Here you go. Thanks. He mutters indifferently, not really regarding me. I take my seat and try not to stare at him. Silence overtakes us and we're simply taking sips interchangeably. Minutes pass and it's clear that the black wolf is mulling over something. His expression doesn't betray much, but his eyes fixated in the distance indicate he's very much focused. Well, perhaps I should try to engage him. I remember what Barissa said. I need to give things time. Just the sheer fact he accepted the invitation is enough. I really don't want to fuck it up by being pushy. And so my patience is rewarded. After a few more minutes, the wolf finally sighs and breaks the silence. I shouldn't have done that. He nods towards my neck. No, you shouldn't. I nod slowly, taking an idle sip of ale. But I understand why you did. He doesn't regard me, so red irises are set on the woods in front of us. Despite his stoic mask, I know he's struggling deep inside. If he didn't have any qualms, he wouldn't agree to sit down with me. I want to reassure him, despite everything, I do not condemn him. I know you're not a monster, Vol. At least I'd like to believe you aren't one. What do you know? He mutters under his breath. Nothing. I shrug. But I follow my compass, and it tells me to trust you, despite the fact that a part of me is screaming, Fly, you fool! I chuckle and he scoffs in amusement, finally looking at me with a half-smile. Perhaps you should listen to your survival instinct. Is that what you'd like? For everyone to be afraid of you and keep their distance? What I'd like is for our lives to be simple again. I guess there's not much chance for that. The wolf takes a long deep swig and stands up. For a moment I think he's about to leave, but instead he simply heads inside to refill his mug. I wait patiently, gazing towards the stars and the moon. I've noticed they cannot recognise a single constellation, not even Orion, which I'm sure should be visible since it's early spring. I poach a balustrade and lean out to gaze, cast my gaze across the sky. Nope, not a f- single familiar star. I chuckle, taking another sip. I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Seeing Vol return, I straighten up and sit back. He's taking off the excess liquid from his overflowing mug. The wolf plops heavily onto his chair and takes a deep breath. I pick up the plate and pass it to him, offering some nibbles. Ah, good pet. Much better a job than that scouring bunny, that's for sure. I almost blush at the compliment. The jab at Triss spoils the moment a little. He's coping with a shitty situation. Hmm? The wolf gives me a curious glance while munching on a piece of sausage. I return the plate back to the table and sigh in resignation. They're not exactly here of their own free will, are they? Where's this coming from? Everyone seems to have an issue with him, just because he's not grateful being kidnapped. Like, how else is he supposed to act? The black wolf looks into the distance, thinking over my words. I wonder if I should perhaps leave this topic alone. But Bull is full of surprises. Well, it's one of the reasons I refused a ward. Huh? I blink. Well, it's one of the top wards you expect to have a bunny catered to your every whim. I hate that idea. It makes one meek and decadent. Serves no real purpose than to inflate one's ego at the expense of another. I'm taken aback by his words. I don't expect Vol to be this deep. Rana hates this bullshit as well. It's the elders who insist. Keeps the other kin in check, they say. If I'm to be honest, I wonder why those bunnies don't sit our throats in our sleep. His words startle me at all. In all fairness, Triss seems like he does hate most of his betters. I'm unsettled by the idea there might be some trouble brewing. Oh, not a worry, Piglet. Will picks up my slight distress. It's a rhetorical question. They don't do anything so they know we retaliate, retaliate against their burrows. You can sleep safe. Yeah, that does not exactly lighten the mood. 
I frown and fall silent. Seems like none of us is happy about this whole situation and those nasty geriatric bigots. Why do they even get a say in anything? If this society is so meritocratic, what possible contribution those geezers could make other than spewing their outdated dogma? I know you're upset with him. He pulls me out of my stupor. Hmm? Well, that's why you left, right? You must have felt mishandled and lashed out. Even Trist was acting out, but he didn't speak. You can only imagine what verbal beating you've given him. But he really tries to do good by others. Always did. You mean Rannoch? He nods, closing his eyes. I can assure you, he's as much uncomfortable with forcing you into this situation as you yourself are. It's just how things work around here. If he wants to change it, he needs to play his part and compromise. Yeah, I get that. I try to reassure him. True, I did get annoyed at first, but as the time went by, I understood every intention behind Rannoch's actions. He was trying to shield me from uncomfortable truths, while at the same time accommodating me in every possible way. I'm actually awaiting his return, quite impatiently, might I add. You're fine, Piglet. He snickers, taking a long chug. You don't need him. You're quite capable as you are. You just need to believe in yourself more. You survived the villa. That's not an easy feat. And from what I heard from Vitha, you did quite well, all things considered. The wolf winks at me. I must admit, it feels good to be praised like this. Rannoch seems to underestimate you. He means well, but sometimes you have to let others stumble and get up on their own. This little separation is a good way to jumpstart your self-reliance. Hmm. Will notices my confusion takes another gulp. When you're dependent on someone, you're at their side out of necessity. Only when you truly don't need another is when the choice to be with them becomes apparent. That's when it means the most. Yeah. I agree, trying to follow his suit, but I'm nowhere near as accustomed to the bitter brew. If you're his path, you at least need to stand beside him rather than drag behind. Rannoch has a tendency to be lenient to the cradle everyone he meets. Despite appearances, it's not exactly a healthy nor helpful trait. Yeah, I get your point. The wolf empties his mug in one go and clanks it on the table. He stands up, this time ready to depart for real. I can see he's struggling with something I give him a moment. Eventually he looks back at me with a worried expression. I start to tell him what I've done. No, there's no need. I protest calmly, standing up and coming to his side. It's between me and you, okay? Well, I made the promise to him. I nod, placing a hand on his shoulder. I know, but is it not up to me to decide whether I was hurt or not? He doesn't even acknowledge me, again locking his gaze with something in the distance. Look, it's forgiven and forgotten. Why make a fuss about it? Rannoch is extremely protective of me. He wasn't there and you're not exactly subtle with words either. He'll think that God knows what happened. I try to reason with him. I don't want this to become sort of some sort of issue between you guys. But... Well... I cut him off with a plead. Since you're talking so much about me standing up for myself, leave Rannoch out of it. For my sake, so he doesn't cradle me more than he already does. He takes a pause and then sighs heavily. Very well, but I still feel like I'm getting off too easy. Good. I agree with a smile. And as penance, you must promise me, we'll do this again. I raise my still half-full mug to him and he smirks. Ah, <laughs> cheeky little piggy. I'll see you around. He nods and hops off the porch, avoiding the steps completely. I watch as he walks towards the village and try to enjoy the remainder of my ale. Having resolved this little spat, I feel like I'll be able to sleep just fine. I give one final gaze towards the lunar, down in my drink and thinking of my wolf. Sleep well. As I stand up, I notice a shiny little trinket on the edge of the table where Wolf sat. I pick it up to reveal the black wolf's I owe you. I smile, shaking my head. I might have become one of the few people, if not the first one, to have his token. With that, I gather the things and head inside. Tomorrow's another day. That will be continued in the next episode. This has been written and illustrated by Kale Tiger. And please rate on each I.O. Support on Patreon if you have some money. And feel free to join the Discord as well. 
And now you've seen why I chose that title for these two episodes. Though it is rather unfair on Anel, I have to say, but I couldn't think anything better. I have not taken a break during this entire recording, so all I'm going to say is thank you, Tiger Cub, Mr. Beaver 11, Rusty Alvarado, Gunnar Muller, Dissonance, Seven King, Ida Corval, Brandon Bradford, Anubis Silverwind, Popot, David Taylor, and The Beholder. Not to mention Sumuto and Grizz. <laughs> They're my top patrons, and thanks to them and all my patrons. I'm going to end it here. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.